Long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series and beyond. I am your host, constant reader Scott Daly, and joining me as always, the last thing you'd want to touch if you were feeling your way around a dark room, <laughs> it's Matt Freeman. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> You know, nice. sometimes they just come to me and I'm like, is this mean? Nah. It's it's, it's fine. It's a little game we play where you <laughs> insinuate that I'm disgusting in some way and I sit here and take it. Yeah, that's a great yeah. game. I love it. It's one yeah. of my favorite games. Yeah. <laughs> this week on the show, our 11-part coverage of Stephen King's Desperation continues as we cover chapters 1 through 3 of part 4. Uh, David comes to them now at the turn of the tide with his plan on how to defeat Tack. Well, really doesn't actually have a plan. He just he just says they have to do it. He doesn't tell them much of anything else. Johnny, of course, being his Johnny self, resists that entirely. Yeah, and, and David also kind of manages to insinuate that everybody's going to die. And it's yeah, not going to go well. Yeah, so. yeah, he needs to take some uh, classes on leadership and speech making, I think. I, I agree. <laughs> and Mary, surprise, Matt. Mary is not uh, not out of the count quite yet as we get a couple little... Little interludes with her escaping tack. Matt, what'd you think of of this week's the penultimate reading of Desperation? Um, I, I gotta say, I love this book. Actually, um, for, for, for <laughs> a book great. for a book that that is that is not regarded as like you know one of his best, it's just like wow, this is really working on me. I, I'm loving everything he's doing. I'm loving these conversations. Um, you know, I, I'd be worried, but King doesn't have a history of tragically killing 11 year old boy characters in his no. books that I can recall. Don't be ridiculous. Um, yeah. So, so <laughs> due to that fact, I'm not worried about what's going to happen to David at all. <laughs> um, and I'm also like really caught up in this drama of, you know, is, uh, is Johnny going to pull a Han Solo? Is he going to, is he going to, you know, get his shit together and turn around and, and, and actually, uh, kind of become the, um, the guy who we know he, he could be. I mean, I'm, it's funny, despite the fact that this whole chapter, he's basically becoming more and more worthless. I'm, I'm sticking to my guns that we're going to see him have a, a, a turnabout and he's going to, um, he's going to sort of serve a, a, a specific role as like a, perhaps a prophet, um, or, uh, you know, at, at least somebody who tells the story of what happened here. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. I mean, I think it, the funny thing about that is like, I think every every convention and storytelling might tell you that, of course, Johnny has to have this turnaround. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen. Right. I think there is there is a, a lane to the end of this this book that doesn't involve Johnny um, realizing how much of a boneheaded idiot he's being. I think you're right. And the, the thing is, like, we've read so many King books and he he really often does, you know, kill the dog metaphorically. Like he he, he does the thing where you're like, you can't you're not supposed to do that. Yeah, yeah. Like that. Like, that's not the feel good choice that I was expecting. This is mm -hmm. this is sad. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I actually suspect that, like, part of the reason why some people I'm not saying it. I'm not saying this is the only reason people sometimes complain about King endings, but I suspect one major reason people complain about King endings is that he does stuff that people don't like. Yeah. Like kills yeah. characters they didn't want to die. And then that kind of makes them mad. And then they're like, King doesn't know how to end a book. And it's just like, we get it. You didn't want that character to die. I'm sorry. You know, but, um, so, so yeah, it's not, not impossible that I could be totally wrong. I, I don't want to, I don't really feel that confident in it. I just feel like that would be this kind of natural thing to do. Like yeah, said. no, I agree with that. I think it's it's all about expectations and and subverting those expectations in ways that drive people crazy. It, it, it just depends on what you go to stories for. Right. Some people go to stories. This, I mean, this is like I, I go to this example a lot, but this is my father who I, I love dearly, but can't stand Stephen King um, for many reasons, some of which being the endings of these things, especially the Dark Tower, infuriate him because he doesn't want that kind of ending. He wants the everyone gets what they want and is happy kind of ending. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see which kind of ending this book is, uh, but first we've got quite a few lines of text to go through this week. Um, before we do that, though, we did just want to once again talk about our newest Patreon exclusive bonus podcast. There's got to be a quicker way of saying that phrase, Patreon exclusive bonus podcast. It's a lot, a lot to say. It's a mouthful. Yeah, we need to make up a word for it and then have that word become just a thing. 
Yeah, we'll work on that. We'll workshop that. Uh, okay. Anyway, um, that show began this week. It is called Castle Talk. Thanks to one of our listeners for recommending that name. We are going to be taking a look at the Hulu original series Castle Rock, two episodes at a time, two episodes a month. We began this month with episodes one and two of the first season. We're going to finish out the year having watched all of Castle Rock. And uh, that was a really fun conversation, Matt. I strongly suggest everyone go check that conversation out. Um, and, and watch the show too. You can watch along with us. It's just two hours a week or a month rather uh, for the next few months. I think I think it'll be fun. And uh, I'm really enjoying this. That, that was, I, I, you know, I, if I'm being if I'm being honest with myself, part of the reason why we ended other levels of the tower is like we were starting to get to the point where we were we were just dragging the bottom of these movies, and I just wasn't looking forward to that recording session as much anymore. Uh, and this. This project already in the first month has completely reinvigorated my excitement for this thing. So I can't wait. Yeah, I just want to add, just in case people have some negative preconceived notion of Castle Rock, the, the TV show, as like, oh, that wasn't that that TV show that got canceled after two seasons? <laughs> can't have been very good. That was kind of my implicit attitude. And it's like, mm-hmm. no, it was actually really great. It was probably mostly canceled due to COVID complications, not due to it not being a good show um i'm really yeah. really enjoying it so far just 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 so we're clear matt is saying that after watching two episodes so it is, it is very possible um that it completely nose dives but, uh, <laughs> that's true <laughs> i'm just saying I'm, just, I'm speaking for the first two episodes i'm having a great time yeah great so yeah that is available right now on our patreon so please please check that out all right matt let's get into it we begin uh, the the not the final part of the book. There is like a very brief part five, but the basically the climax part of the book called part four, the China pit. God is cruel. There's that that statement again, that kind of uh, that thesis statement of the story. I think it's interesting, you know, we're, we're rapidly approaching the end of the book here and we haven't really gotten our, our, our firm grasp on like what we're actually saying with that statement, right? Like, is this just a matter of fact statement? said in the book that we're supposed to just take as the truth and that's it and well the 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 events of the book will play out in a a manner in which that will prove that statement correct or are we are we intentionally going to like um subvert expectations on that statement what's your feeling here going into part four that's a really good point that we haven't talked about it I, i i guess i've been kind of waiting to see when the other shoe will drop and 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 how things resolve. I mean, it's, it's, I guess the most immediate thing that I would say about it as a statement is like, um, the, the, the real phrase that you hear people say is God is merciful Mm -hmm. and mercy, mercy and cruelty aren't exactly opposite, but they're pretty close to being opposite. Like cruelty basically doesn't just mean, you know, hard Mm -hmm. cruel cruelty means like, unnecessarily vindictively excessively causing suffering right that's mm-hmm. what that's what cruel means like i i, I would even say R- roland I, I can't think of a single time that roland is cruel although roland is extremely harsh and and unforgiving you know roland is certainly not merciful um i'm, I'm just i'm just picking him as a character who's like a notorious hard ass in this in this story while you know the characters who i think of as being cruel are like uh, randall flag so, so to say God is cruel, you're totally right to to call it into question because it's like, has God has the God character in this book done anything really cruel, or has the God character simply done what had to be done to fight evil? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you know the latter is much more true. And yeah, and and also like mercy, p- perhaps merciful in small ways where possible in ways that maybe we haven't noticed because so much horrible shit has been happening constantly. Sure. Um, sure. But yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I don't while, know. while you were talking, I, I went ahead and just looked up the definition of the word cruel, because like, this is a word that we use all the time and, and we feel like we know what it means, but how often do we actually like look at the definition of things? Um, yeah, so sure. according to the Oxford dictionary, cruel willfully causing pain or suffering to others or feeling no concern about it. Mm, okay. Um, which interesting. is interesting, right? Like the, I, I was like, because I think that the latter half like is, I mean, is God indifferent to suffering? No, probably not. Right. Like, I, but that doesn't mean he's going to like step in and stop it. Right. Like, I, I, I don't know. This is, 
it's, it's really interesting because like, I, I you know, I, I think, I think one of the things that got to me on this rating more than anything is this idea uh, when he's talking to who we now know is a, a young Johnny Marinville um, in the land of the dead. He, he asks him, you know, what is like, basically he, he defines malice, which is cruelty, cruelty with evil intent right like Mm -hmm. so so the book has kind of defined cruelty for us and then said yes there's cruelty but then there's cruelty there there's like there's this thing but then there's this thing which is which is that but but with a specific kind of malice to it i mean that's Mm -hmm. what they 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 call it they call it malice so like in my mind malice would be not feeling no concern about it but feeling positive about it right like wanting it Um, yeah yeah i mean i I guess in that sense there is a there is a mile of difference between causing harm because you enjoy it and causing harm because you have to and you don't really care (laughs) yeah um that's that's really interesting i guess this conversation we're having now is reminding me of something that happens like way later in the chapters today but but um basically the the idea is is that I, i believe david says something along the lines of um you know, God can't possess people because he can't violate their free will. That's kind of what makes him God. Mm-hmm. And that's such a charged thing to say, like, that's what makes him God. It's not the omnipotence. It's not the, <laughs> you know, whatever else. It's like, well, well, yeah, kind of, because God is like that which respects the idea that you're allowed to make your own choices. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and sometimes I guess it's like, if... I, I think sometimes that can look like cruelty because it's like leaving you to make your choice and maybe you're going to make the wrong choice and it's going to have horrible consequences. Whereas maybe the, you know, kind thing to do in some sense would be, I'm just going to kind of, you know, psychically take you over or, or nudge you or possess you or whatever. And, and we're, we're going to, you know, you're not going to do that thing. You're not going to do that damaging thing. Um, yeah. And it's like, okay, well in, in some, in some sense that's kinder, but in another like bigger sense, now humans don't have free will and we're we're just puppets and yeah. and like all meaning has been extinguished from the universe because you couldn't bear to sort of be sufficiently cruel to let humans make their mistakes. Yeah, I like that. I I think, you know, there's this danger we do whenever we start talking about this that's like are we talking about a god in the christian sense or are we talking about god specifically in the sense of the the character that exists in this novel right. right um and and i agree with you the character that exists in this novel the defining characteristic of him it whatever is freedom of choice is mm. ca- i can't make you do this i won't make you do this um you have to be willing to do this on your own and and that i think it is important and that is the the major contradiction between tack and god is this this idea of you must you must choose at the end of the day you must choose and i think we see that here you know we have the the very stereotypical marinville rejecting of the call thing here um we'll see we'll see what happens there but i i love that that scene ends with him walking out of the van right like we don't know what's going to happen there might still be a turnaround at the end there we leave this week's reading with with david going after johnny but the book like uh, the book and the and god within the book just allows him to walk out of the van and and walk away um and and i think that that matters i think something else th- that you were saying there about about cruelty reminded me of another part of the conversation that we're going to have here in in this first chapter where david says god is cruel and and marinville reacts very specifically to that like that's a phrase he recognizes from somewhere which you know we can think what that might might possibly mean but but the other thing he says is life is more than just steering a course around pain um which is a a really i I love that sentence and that's i think that's a way of of reframing the idea of cruelty is refining in a way that doesn't quite piss me off so much if you know what i mean that like like you know the, the phrase of like oh you know god is making these bad things happen to you because he's he's refining you and strengthening you for for future challenges or yada 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 but i, I like the idea that no no it's not that it's just life is not just happiness and good feelings it's everything it's all of it and 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 a life that avoids all instances of pain and suffering is not life and that's kind of the big thing we see with johnny this week is that's the thing that that ghost terry or god terry if we want to call her that says to him is like you stopped living you you were so afraid of dying that you stopped living and 
and that is part of it. Running away from suffering, running away from pain, running away from hurt is, is part of that. You know, your, your son is just at the age where, um, when you take him to the playground, I'll bet there's a huge temptation to like kind of swoop in and, Oh, no, you, you, yeah, you, you don't want to climb that. That's dangerous. Ah, yeah, yeah. Let's just go over to this section. Ah, you know what? We're not going to, we're not going to do that. The ladder. No, that's too tall. Mm-hmm. And it's very hard, um, to be cruel enough to let your kid do dangerous things that are like <laughs> gonna hurt them. Like, like yeah. I, I'm not saying you're going to let your kid do something that's going to really injure them, but like you, you're watching and you're like odds that we leave this place in tears are like <laughs> 25 percent you know and but you just have to kind of let it happen because it's part of childhood it's part of growth it doesn't yeah. really hurt them that badly you know if like they maybe they bang their head a little bit it's fine it's fine it, it's much better to let them do that than to than to stifle them and you know in, in this position of course you're your god and your son is humanity and that's mm-hmm. <laughs> that's that, that's that's kind of how it is right it's more than just steering a course around pain in fact that would be utterly stultifying and and um, be bad, bad for your, your son actually, yeah. if you did that. No, d- totally. I, I, that, that's great. And, and you know, the, the more I'm a parent, the more I realize that the way we talk about God's relationship with humanity is so similar to the way we talk about how a parent's relationship to a child, right? Like that is just, and, and I think that makes sense when you're writing about God, like you're, you, like you're, you're positioning it in in a thing that is very familiar to you and for most people on this planet the the, the father or the not the father the, the parent child relationship is one of their most impactful important relationships ever and so it, it makes sense that the, that we talk about god's relationship with us and in, in this specific kind of way i think you're you're totally right yep um I, my, my kind of spin-off example of that is is just the ways in which not only do you have to let them suffer sometimes but also let them struggle like one of the things that we're trying to get my son to like kind of help out with with some small chores around the house and one of them is just feeding the dogs something Mm -hmm. he likes doing but he sometimes has trouble like getting the scoop into the thing of of dog food sufficient enough to be a big scoop and like the thing i've noticed my son doing is like when he's struggling with it he'll just be like you do it that you do it Mm -hmm. and like I don't, I, I, I won't like, I can't, I was like, no, yeah. you need to, you need to figure this out. You need to, you, I know you can do it. I've seen you do it before. And just like being that thing that, you know, the, the example of God is just like every time someone's suffering, every time someone's struggling, every time someone's trying to get through something, just swooping in and being like, I got it, got it for you. It's gonna be fine. I'll, I'll handle this. I'll handle the hard part. And you never learn how to do anything. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so th- this this is maybe a, a weird example, but sometimes I feel like this weird sense of like I'm glad I didn't win the lottery when I was 18, because <laughs> like that would have that would have yes spared me a lot of suffering in some sense, but also it would have like ruined me, and I never would have had all of the growth that I had due to all mm-hmm. this all the all the different struggles that I have gone through, and so it's yeah. like. It, 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 that thought is usually followed up immediately by but but like now i'm ready to win the lottery so, <laughs> yeah. so. Yeah, 38 38 is the perfect year yeah it's, uh, let's go ahead and let's just lock in that lottery win for us i'm I, i'm good now yeah I'm, I'm done i'm done developing and struggling let's just write it out yeah <laughs> um yeah no, great. I, I love this conversation. I think this is, is great. And I think we're we're right in lane with the things that the book wants us to be thinking about. So um with that in mind, why don't we actually get to the the book itself? <laughs> okay. 20 minutes into the podcast. Um, so chapter one of part four, we catch up with the Kali and Trajan Survival Society inside Steve's truck. David is awake. And to continue our kind of uh, not very thinly veiled Jesus metaphor, it is kind of like David has, quote unquote, died and been resurrected here, right? Like he was strangled. He passed out. I don't think his heart actually stopped beating, but he went through this this thing and he's woken up here. He's gotten his direction from God and he seems entirely clear on what happens next. Um, he doesn't have any doubt anymore. He's just going. And, and I love how this like truck full of adults are just completely commanded by by him like her attention is totally commanded they're planning on leaving they say and david just says no he doesn't say anything else he just says no um and and everyone in the truck except johnny of course including his own father just kind of accept it and i i love i love how that plays out i love like like he he comes back he's i I joked about in the intro but he's he's 
David the White now. He's, he's yeah. Gandalf returned um, at the turn of the tide yeah, to, basically. to guide them to victory. I, I agree. I mean, everyone in the story also understands what they're caught up in. Even mm-hmm. Johnny, mm-hmm. he's just being kind of a coward about it. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, I love that. I love also what you said about him being resurrected. Like, like you said, it's not that he was literally resurrected. It's that we're going for that imagery, I think. Yeah, yeah. But speaking of Johnny, man, this guy, <laughs> this is the the fuck this guy week for sure. Right. Uh, more yep. than more than any so far in this book. This definitely. I really liked this, though. Um, he said he says to Johnny, there's stuff we have to do. You know it, don't you? That's why you waited for me to wake up. No, David, not at all. We just didn't want to risk moving you until we were sure you were okay. Yet this felt like a lie to his heart. He found himself filling with a vague, fluttery nervousness. It was the way he felt in the last few days before beginning a new book, when he understood the inevitable could not be put off much longer, that he would soon be out on the wire again, clutching his balance pole and riding his stupid little unicycle. Oh, I hate this guy. I hate him. But I love him too. I really do. And I I love this moment of this admission that he's losing control he's losing control of his life he's losing control of his safety net and it absolutely terrifies him this entire section of the book everything he does from here on out is clearly just driven by fear um and and i think my favorite thing that this thing does here matt is it connects this fear that he's feeling in this moment to his fear of writing and 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 this is is this perfect kind of circle back around to you know who is Johnny what is his life now he's not really a writer anymore right he hasn't been a writer for a while he's just kind of coasting he's just kind of coasting in life Terry calls this out specifically he's not really living anymore um and and it's not to be a writer it's just to, I think to, she says to talk about writing right and so he's just living in this perpetual state of fear. And and all this is connected, and I, I love it so much. Yeah, he's on this stunt tour on his on his motorcycle. Um, yeah, yeah. You know. The stupid the stupid idea that like was stupid from the beginning. We called that out, right? Like it was stupid and lame, and there's a terrible name. And yeah, it, but it was safe. It was safe. He didn't have to risk anything because one, you know, he's recycling some old essays. Two, he's maybe writing some other essays, but like they're not about him, right? I think that's the important thing. Like. It feels like like in the world of of Johnny Marinville, like fiction is incredibly personal to him. But nonfiction, you're writing about other people, and that's mm-hmm. safe. Mm, I like that. Yeah, that's that's a great point. I, I I I admit I'm only only belatedly catching on to this idea that you know he being this sort of failed writer is central to the conflict of his character. Like I got I got mm-hmm. that that was an element of his character and that was part of his backstory. But it's like he he has been hiding from his true self is one way of putting it right yeah yeah um but um yeah um so the other thing about you know fear is like uh, we said a few weeks ago desperation is king's take at writing a bible story Mm -hmm. and if you're really living the events of a bible story it's going to be deeply frightening and confusing i think in a way that doesn't come across when you're listening to the weekly reading in church, um, the, 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 you know, if, if these things were really happening to you, you would be overwhelmed. Um, you know, you like to think you would be one of the noble heroes like Daniel in the lion's den. Um, and maybe it never occurs to you sitting in church that Daniel was probably scared absolutely shitless the entire time <laughs> that he was in the lion's den, because while he had faith and while he had innocency, he didn't necessarily have a hundred percent faith. Like, I don't think the story says that he didn't have any doubt. He didn't have any thought thought that, you know, these these lions could like, I mean, they could just, (laughs) they might just eat me. And then I, you know, but, um, so, so I think Johnny like wigging out and, and and freaking out here is actually key to what we're doing in the story. Like in terms of it being this, this sort of Bible story, this modern Bible story, it's, it's what you would do. You know, it's, it's what I would do. I I would, I would be like, okay, look, like, like if, if there really are demons, I'm getting the hell out of here. Like I'm, I, it would take a amazing effort of, of courage to really be like, all right, yeah, let's just, you know, fight the demon. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like that. I I think, and, and let me, uh, stand back. God, I'm about to critique your book. Um, (laughs) I mean, one of the things that that does frustrate me about the Bible sometimes is, is, you know, like there's there's a lot of like incredibly 
interesting stories in this book, right? Like mm. really interesting stuff. But the, the Bible is trying to do this very specific thing and be this very specific thing where it's trying to kind of coach and guide uh, and teach. And so, yeah, maybe there's not room in the story of of, of Daniel in the lion's den um, for, for his doubt and fear and uncertainty. But like those are human emotions and like to connect to your reader, those are the things you want to, you want to experience. Like you, you want to know that's that the doubt is normal, but, but you can, you can persist through it anyway. Right. Like yeah. I, I, that is one thing that I don't see a lot in the Bible. And, and so like this idea that King is trying to write this Bible story, but he's going to do it in a way that he's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to take like a Bible story, like, like the lion's den, but I'm going to humanize the shit out of it. And I'm going to say, okay, what was it like to be Daniel? What is it like to have God come down to you and say, okay, we're going to do this thing. And I'm, I'm not even going to tell you it's going to be fine. Cause it might not be fine. Um, there's, there's lions in there. Uh, go. Yeah. And, and like, actually like, like I've always wondered what, what a, a true adaptation of Job is. That's just, What's it like to be that guy? Yeah. <laughs> and 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 a lot of a lot of what this book is doing is is a similar thing to that. And so it's like it is it is living in this world of 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 Bible story and, and of religion and spirituality and these things that the book is taking as a hundred percent true, but it's saying, okay, but like what it would be what it would be like to be a person in that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, especially in a world where if you really take it seriously, you realize that God's will doesn't necessarily have to mean that you're going to you know win mm -hmm. like god's will can be something totally unrelated to you or bad for you even mm -hmm. <laughs> there's, there's no law that says god's will has to make everyone involved better off yeah yeah definitely no i mean yeah and, and you should you should not even have that expectation actually right. exactly kind of the lesson exactly um, this i'm jumping ahead a little bit but this gets me to something that i think is is really interesting that i was thinking about is you know, Johnny's realization that like, like in Trajan slash tack before him, he is afraid of David. He is afraid of David Carver and he's afraid of the God that, that supports him. And, and I, 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 it got me thinking about this because like, I just remember being a kid and being a kid, a Catholic kid and hearing this, this term thrown around this, 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 you know, are you, are you God fearing? Right. And I, and as a kid, I never understood it. Because I was like the, the God that I was taught about when I was a kid was one of like like love and acceptance and and generosity and and kindness and grace and and just like the idea that you'd be afraid of that thing just didn't make any sense to me in, in my in my kid brain right but like through the lens of this book looking at it now and 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 all this thing it's like oh yes of course that makes total sense like of course like it's only kind of natural to be afraid of something like this because yeah to your point like it, you know good for the existence doesn't necessarily mean good for you <laughs> in, the, in the short term yeah i mean if you take seriously the idea that it's an omnipotent being um who who has interests other than you know yours mm -hmm. uh at heart then uh, it's a terrifying idea. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely a, a holdover from you know a depiction of God that is a lot different from our our modern New Testament depiction. Like that term is a holdover from that period. But I I don't know. It's there's still something that works in it. I think, especially in the context of this this story. Yeah, I mean it, the, the New Testament is not is not necessarily totally consistent about the idea that God is is. 100 percent all forgiving all all loving either right i mean th there's some ambiguity there i think there's some there are some things even that jesus says that are not like totally in, in keeping with sort of our, our childhood view of, of god as like you know perfectly forgiving just you know just loves us as, you know yeah like like hell is still a thing right like sure yeah but, yeah no definitely um i mean you know this is this is more of a reflection not not necessarily a reflection of new versus old testament but which is more of a reflection of how society shapes and uh, uh understands its relationship with its gods as the the wants and needs of society changes over time right yep yep all right. Um, I, I wanted to talk about this a little bit, though, because this is <laughs> the kind of paragraph that I think would drive some certain people crazy. So David says, Tack is a god or a demon. 
Or maybe nothing at all, just a name, a nonsense syllable, but a dangerous nothing, like the voice in the wind. It doesn't matter. What does is that my mom should be put to rest, that she, then she can be with my sister in, well, in wherever there is for us after we die. I, I This is great, because like, I love when King does this, of just like, yeah, he's like a thing. It doesn't look, it doesn't matter what he is. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Don't worry about it. And it's just like, I think that would drive a certain type of reader crazy that there's no tangible answer that the book gives on what is this thing? What does it want? A- and that the book even lampshades that by saying it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, which I think is always true, right? In these stories, like the plot the, and, and the, the, the central plot of the book matters less than the story. But like yeah. you don't say that. <laughs> you, don't, you don't actually go and say that out loud. Right. It is fascinating because, you know, the guy the guy in the dream basically said, you know, ah, you know, evil is weak and it inevitably inevitably burns itself out after it does some damage. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about that. It's like actively undercutting what you would normally think of as the stakes <laughs> of a story like this. Right, right. Um, which I think the anti Marvel. Like th- this is consistently, I think what King does is he's like, no, nah, that's not what the stakes are. The stakes are are the character stakes, which yeah. have really nothing to do with like, is tack going to spread across the land? It's like, no, it's not. Yeah. Don't worry about that. That's not <laughs> what you should be worried about. You're so right, because this is I mean, spoilers for it. If people I mean, everyone's read it, right? Like the, the big difference between the book, it and it chapter two is that the movie is that the book, it like the final confrontation with Pennywise in the book wasn't because, Oh, he's, he's getting more powerful over time. And eventually he's going to break out of the confines of dairy. And, and it's just, no, we're at this point in our life and we need to confront these things from our childhood. And then the movie comes along and says like, no, if you don't kill it right now, you're all going to die. And which is just silly and not what King does at all. Right. Like, like it's just, the, the the way stakes in these stories operate is so different from how they're usually operated. And I think that King does that specifically to, like you said, keep the focus on what matters, which is the characters and the choices the characters are making. All right, Matt. So the other thing David says here is that he's kind of learned the real story of what happened here in Desperation, what happened in the China pit, what happened to un- unleash this whole thing upon the world. He's 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 realized all this. And and he's going to tell them a story, but Johnny refuses to listen. Johnny doesn't want to listen to the story. He doesn't care. And and we see that the voice of Terry returns to his head to try to write him, but he's not listening. And we get this line here, Matt. And that, he thought, was why he had divorced Terry in the first place. In a fucking nutshell, she had been a divi- she had been a divine lay, but she had never known when to shut up and listen to her intellectual betters. What a dickhead. <laughs> he's such a dickhead. But it's so funny that the, it's framed like this because, like, so far throughout the story, all we know Terry as is the wise voice in his head and on the phone, giving him ideas, <laughs> uh-huh. setting him straight. Like, like it, it, our understanding of the Terry Johnny relationship is that he's a fucking idiot and she's the smart one that that was the only one that was ever able to kind of keep him in line, right? Yeah. And so, like, this is, again, just another instance of Johnny just lying to himself. Like, that's been a theme throughout this entire book, especially related to Terry, is just his ability to just completely lie to himself. Yeah, I mean, it's been consistent throughout the whole story, but it really jumped out to me how much of a, like, egomaniac is the word I reach for, (laughs) although maybe it's not quite right. But it's, it's like he has this incredibly inflated view of himself, and he has to keep reminding himself of how important he is and yeah. how how great he is and it's, it's like this litany it reminds me of, of of the killer which we just watched where it's like he has this litany in his head of, of all of the of, like how awesome he is and how everyone loves him and how smart yeah. he is and how accomplished he is and, and it's like he has to keep pumping himself up because if he doesn't do that then he'll just like notice what an idiot and and you know N- that 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 actually no one loves him right <laughs> that, yeah. that, that, that actually he has no friends um he, he only yeah. has fans um uh-huh. and it's all so dated it's all old like yeah, everything yeah. Ev- like you know like i forget how many times this, this book uses the phrase literary lion when talking to him which is we're talking about him which is just like dripping in king sarcasm right like like there's just so much so much added oomph on that phrase but like everything is like when he was once called 
the the only important white male writer in America, I think that we're going to see a little bit later. But like all these are like quotes about him years and years and years old. And it's the same thing when he talks about how he once bagged like uh, Miss America or something uh-huh. or like or like the Hollywood it girl. And it's like, yeah, it was like 30 years past her prime or blah, blah. Like it's just like he's coasting on things people said about him decades ago. Yeah. Uh, as the entire idea of his self-worth. I mean, it's 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 like a, a middle aged person, like carrying around his his high school football trophy. It's yeah. just it's pathetic. It makes me love it even more that this was how Intragian sort of r- lured him in was by yeah. Yeah. by flattering his ego and talking about being a fan. Um, it, like that's that, that's, <laughs> you know, we, we've, we've introduced this element that Intragian sort of had to like. um lure them in it couldn't just like you know bash them over the head and and, and arrest them there there had to be this game of cat and mouse for some reason and the fact that that was what you know this is his weakness right this is his his flaw this is what Mm. what, this is what was used to um to secure him was his um, vulnerability to being basically um flattered yeah yep absolutely so David tells the group that the talk has removed their barriers to exit. The RVs that were blocking the road have been pulled away. The animals themselves have been pulled away. Tack himself is gone, resting in his cave. They can leave now if they want to. And Tack wants them to. He wants them to leave now. He's like, I'm tired of you people. Get out of here. But that doesn't matter because God doesn't want them to leave. I, I love this quote here as well. Then why did he bring us here in the first place? He didn't. What? He thinks he did, but he didn't. I don't have any idea what your God brought us, David said, to stop him. I, like that is, is once again, like this idea of evil, like thinking it's in control and 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 doing all these things intentionally. And, you know, it's, it's what you said about the order versus random, you know, chaos mm-hmm. versus purpose. Um, these these constant themes in King's works. And, and here it is once again. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. I, I do love the story, David, telling you. I think you were just kind of talking about this, but the the, the idea that Tack needs pretext to pull them over in the, the like we, we we chatted about this at the beginning of the novel, right? Where we were kind of like, it's kind of weird that that this crazy man that's just going to shoot this guy in in the face as soon as they get into desperation, like needed a reason to arrest them. Like he needed probable cause to search the trunk and, and read them their Miranda rights. It's, it's kind of weird, right? Like why do that? Why play this game? Well, David reasons here for us that, that perhaps there, this was some of the Intragian left in here. Um, this was yeah. some of, of the person that he was inhabiting, influencing his behavior. Um, and, and, you know, ultimately it's just acting at random, but, but, that that is that is how this thing played out it's it's really great I, I love that yeah i love this idea i mean it even sort of suggests that there was something like like good and noble in in intragian in in, in collier intragian that f- sort of forced tack to take this approach um which was then used by god which is a fun yeah. idea yep, um, yep it also implies that god put the weed in the trunk of the car so that <laughs> they would be arrested because it wanted them to be arrested uh-huh uh-huh yep I love also this vague idea that 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 uh, David says here of we don't have to do what God sent us here to do, but if we don't, we'll pay the price. He says, and he doesn't really elaborate on that here. What what does it mean to pay the price? And, and, and the thing I like is he's not like because he doesn't elaborate. There's no specific thing he's talking about. There's no like we'll go to hell, we'll be cursed. It just seems to be like this this overall sense of like spiritual rot, maybe. Um, like this, just this idea of it, you, you don't follow God's will and there won't be perhaps any direct immediate consequence, but there will be just this, this decay or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, it's basically, I, I, it, it's complicated, right? It's, it's sort of like yeah. the, the idea of hell is the absence of God maybe is, is, is a thought that occurs to me in, mm-hmm. in this context where it's like, yeah, it's, it's not that you, it's not that something supernatural happens to you. It, it's, it's simply that you have made the wrong choice <laughs> and you know that you made the wrong choice and that in and of itself is a kind of torture for you. Um, yeah. But um, yeah. I mean, it could be worse than that. I, I, 
but that's that's the thought that comes to my mind yeah i mean there's some there's some little vague senses of like like tack has put his mark on you that we're told right and 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 you know you'll feel that like so there's some specific stuff there but that comes later that that's not what what uh, david's talking about right now so yeah i, I really do right. like this idea of just this this overall sense of like you do have free will but like god's god's plan for you and god's path for you is one of 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 fulfillment and straying from that will leave you ultimately unfulfilled right right um so david manages to convince johnny to stay just long enough to tell him uh, the accurate story of what happened in the china pit and so the next bit of of the book is is basically that story it's 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 david exposition um but i don't know like you know we talk a lot about you know what in which ways exposition works and doesn't work for for whatever reason and maybe we can dissect the reason here tonight is the way king frames this this whole section i found it to be some of the most page turning parts of the novel um and I'm, I'm curious what you thought of it oh yeah i mean page turning is a great is a great description um it is um it, it's it's fun in a in a way that i think most of the novel has, has not been because a lot of it has been sort of like harrowing and horrible and, and terrifying. Whereas mm-hmm. this is, this is sort of a um, f- like fast paced, um, exciting. And, and we kind of already know how it ends. So a lot of the like dread is removed. It's just like, yeah. Oh, we're, we're finally getting the answers to these questions we had about like what really happened. Sure. Um, and, and so yeah, just overall, um, yeah. Enjoyable page turner is a great description. I also think one really clever thing King does here is, be, we've we've heard the story this is the second time we've actually heard the story of what happened in the china pit right we got we got a version of the story from tom billingsley and now we see the quote-unquote real version from david and i think just just that idea that that we the reader are as we're reading are like comparing and the, the story is inviting us to compare i think pulls you along a little bit more because you're like oh it's di- here's here's the ways in which it's different from the way you were told it was earlier and i think that is just in, inherently enticing to a reader. Um, yeah i think there's like a, a little clever conceit that i, I like like this type of thing like did was that done intentionally was it like a, how do i how do i make the exposition here sing a little bit more it's like oh well we'll have it told one way and then we'll show the real way later i don't know yeah i mean it's not a full-blown rashomon obviously but it, it no. does have elements of just like the the enjoyability of of realizing like oh that was that wasn't right and then you get mm-hmm. to f- fix it i don't know it, it's it's funny to consider why we enjoy that kind of thing but but i, I yeah. agree um it's fun to it's, it's like you're being let in on a secret basically yeah yeah definitely so we learned matt about the original mining group made out of mostly chinese men but not entirely uh they break into this cave system they immediately find thousands of cantas everywhere they pick them up go crazy start fucking and murdering each other like you do uh oh also uh they might be slowly transforming into animals i think david compares this to the island of dr moreau actually yeah yeah that's that's i mean I, 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 what, so I didn't get the sense they were physically turning into animals so much as like their animal nature was coming out, but I could have just been mistaken. Maybe they are turning into animals. Well, um, Island of Dr. Moreau is a story about people being turned into animals. Right. So. Yeah, yeah. But I, I thought, I, I thought, that, I thought that was more about the sounds they were making. Yeah, it was, it was. But, but yeah, anyway, yeah, that's a, and, and that's, uh, I don't, the, the movie with, um, Val Kilmer was, uh, very disturbing to young Matt. D- this is this is the the fascinating question here because like so this the the original film which was based off of the H.G. Wells story uh-huh. uh, came out in 1977. Um, there was a version of this movie that you're referencing here that was with Val Kilmer and Marlon Brando who played Doctor Moreau that came out in '96, uh-huh. the same year this book came out. Yep. And so like, there's part of me in my head's like, did you were you writing this when the movie came Probably. out? Probably. I, I've or, come or, to believe that the answer. Or were you Stephen King just talking about this movie came out in August uh-huh. of 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 ninety six? So like, there's no way he saw this. Like, <laughs> I'm I'm absolutely convinced that King was just writing about this the nineteen seventy seven version of this movie because he probably saw it and loved it, and then like it just so happened that a new version of the film came out that same year, and so like the the reference here is like 
no one would ever believe David Carver had seen a, a 1977 version of The Island of Dr. Moreau. But for the people reading this book right when it came out, are like, oh, he's naturally talking about that new movie that just came out. Uh-huh. Like, uh, it's, yeah, just coincidence, man. I'm convinced it's just coincidence. I, you know, King might have seen the trailer, you know, and then been <laughs> I, like, I guess, remembered that The Island of Dr. Moreau existed. <laughs> I suppose. I suppose. No, it's very satisfying, though, to get this explanation of, you know, what what really happened. Yeah. Um, we kind of learn where the Kentaz came from, kind of. Mm-hmm. I mean, kind of not, though, kind of not really, because it's like, yeah. well, we don't know what they are. We also learn okay. about the the any. Is that how it's pronounced in the audiobook? Because that's how I always said it in my head. But I mean, the audiobook he just says any. Okay. And I, I actually just sort of involuntarily see it as like a big belly button in the ground <laughs> um, because it's an any, obviously. I think that's fair. That's totally fair. Yeah. Um. So that's the any or the well of worlds. Um. And there's that's that's Tox home. Um, yep. Matt, we also learned that the two of the Chinese men didn't touch any of the statues immediately and they just got the hell out of there. They shooting anyone that gets in their way out of the tunnel. Then they immediately start trying to collapse the tunnel behind them. Uh, David is asked in this moment if God is possessing them. And this goes back to what you were talking about earlier, where David basically says, I don't think God has to possess. That's what makes him God. I think they wanted I think they wanted what God wanted to keep tack and earth to bring the ceiling down between them and it if they could. Man, uh, we talked about this already, but like I, I love this this idea of he doesn't have to possess them. They just want what God wants. So done. Yeah, we, we did it. I want this is to me not like my new working definition of a gunslinger is, <laughs> is you know, somebody who wants what God wants. And, and they, <laughs> I love that they, they are being a tool of God. They're not necessarily going about it in, in, in a nice way either, because, mm-hmm. um, I mean, basically just the fact that they are like running, gunning their way out of this mine blowing people away trying to blow it up it's it struck me as a very uh uh, gunslinger content type thing to do yeah yeah i think it does perfectly fit the you know the warriors of of the white in in king stuff are not like the the noblest most moral wonderful perfect beings in the world they're actually often the exact opposite of that but yeah but they are fighting for the side of good they're flawed, but they're trying in, in some yeah. way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, they they eventually succeed. They cause the cave in. I, I do like the detail here, Matt. This is something I really liked, and I think one of the another things that that pulls you along through this exposition. Uh, the, the the thing that David says is like, no one had a picnic. No one like just came and shrugged and said, "Up, oh, can't help them." We hear the people screaming, "Can't help them!" Like they actually came and did assessments and like tried to see. If, if it's possible to dig them out. And th- th- certainly the end decision making was, oh, well, these are just some Chinese people. They don't matter as much. Right. Like that was involved in the decision making. But I just found it really interesting. Like we, we, we look at history and we we talk about the ways in which history downplays the terribleness of, of actions a lot, um, which it does. But I also think it was interesting in this case where the, the true story actually was was up playing the cruelness of what happened here that it that it was it was making making people seem worse than they actually were um, yeah because it, it wasn't quite as bad people weren't casually picnicking like that didn't happen people weren't like casually just sitting around going up oh, nothing we can do that didn't happen either a lot of people worked very hard they just were unsuccessful i don't know i just feel like we we get that specifically called out here and it, it jumped out to me yeah, I, I agree. It's really interesting. I'm not sure exactly how that fits into everything, but just, you know, people aren't as quite as bad as, as sometimes we would like to believe of ourselves. Um, yeah, yeah. Maybe because like this is a place of evil, like the, 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 it's, it's the worst possible version of the story that is the one that gets propagated and, and exists in, into legend and myth and stuff like that. And it, and it kind of harms the world through making everyone believe that mankind is, is just so awful. I, I like yeah. that. Yeah. But the part of the story that was true, we learned was that the two uh, Chinese men go into a local bar and end up dead. Um, we, we learned this is actually days later, not hours later after attack had managed to get full control of them. Um, because just being around the any being around this well being around the cantas still had had an effect on them which i mean matt does that mean our characters will eventually be taken out by tack like steve cynthia these two characters that have touched one of the cantas 
that that's not good. I mean, it, it certainly leaves open the possibility that that could happen. But I, I, I mean, I, I feel like if if they thoroughly defeat TAC in the way that God intends them to, mm-hmm. um, then then they probably won't have to have to suffer that way. Like I, I'm thinking, I, so I sort of am, am viewing this this you know well of worlds this any as being a literal portal you know between mm, mm-hmm. between worlds to some eldritch cthulhu dimension where tack lives and like the the book doesn't say this but it kind of would seem to make sense if the idea isn't to just like bury this portal again but to actually destroy the portal somehow um mm, I'm, I'm not yeah. sure of that but it I, I don't know it would it would seem it would seem somehow inelegant if it was like, yeah, one time a hundred years ago they collapsed the mine and then somebody dug it up again and opened it and now they're just going to collapse it again. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't seem like, I, I don't know, I, maybe it'll happen, but it, it doesn't sound like it would be worth it to, to go through all this if that's all they're going to do. Yeah, and no, I get you. I get you. Cool. All right. Um, so the the story ends, and we get we've kind of already talked about this a bit, but we'll we'll talk about it again. Uh, boy, that god of yours, what a guy! Marinville says cheerfully. Really knows how to repay a favor, doesn't he, David? God is cruel, David said in a voice almost too low to hear. What? Marinville asked. What did you say? You know, but life is more than just steering a course around pain. That's something you used to know, Mister Marinville, didn't you? Sick burn. Got him. Um. <laughs> what do you think of his reaction to it, though? Like, you know, with with the reveal of of Marinville being the the person that David met in uh in in the land of the dead, is, is there something about this the statement "God is cruel" that is more specific and personal to Marinville than we've been led to believe so far? Like, he I don't know if I'm reading too much into this, but he seems to have a specific reaction to that statement. I felt that way too, and I, I also feel like when the author read this line in the audiobook um there was there was a little bit of sharpness to that not just mm-hmm. like you know sorry i didn't hear you but like right. l- like s- startled yeah yeah, s- yeah. S- s- startled to hear the kids say this and and then we just kind of breeze past it but it did feel like an important moment when it happened mm-hmm. um and i i figure we'll f- learn more about this later yeah well we'll see Uh, But from here, we move away from David and over to Mary. And Matt, congratulations. You were right. Mary is not dead yet. She's not been tackified. I knew Uh, it. She's she's still got a shot. I knew it. (laughs) I actually really, really love this entire sequence with Mary in the spooky bug shed, right? Like, this is actually one of the clearest memories of the book to me is her, her wandering and escape. Like, like this is legitimately horrifying, scary stuff. And, And I don't have really any kind of like debilitating phobia of any of the animals in the shed. But like, just imagine being in a completely dark building, feeling around with your hands and, and just touching bugs and feeling them move and hearing them move. And, and like over there in the corner, there's rattling from rattlesnakes and everything's poisonous and you're having to feel around with your hands. Yeah. It's, so good it's so good yeah i love this book so much i love this stuff this it's just delightful and then you add the smell and also she's like feeling flesh and the comparison to like the holly halloween like a monkey brain like that oh, it's so good man i i love it i love it me too so mary is able to navigate around very carefully she eventually finds a flashlight she turns it on sees the whole room stuffed with bugs, snakes, rats, and other stuff. But but Matt, she sees something else. She sees a row of three men, uh, all former hosts of TAC, all dead. And Mary realizes that she's next. Yep. And that's that's where we leave her behind for now. She she realizes she's got to get out of here. Mm-hmm. And I, I think at this point, I felt like, okay, she'll probably get out of here. We're just not going to, we're not just going to watch her get eaten too. That would mm-hmm. be anticlimactic in the extreme I don't think we knew a hundred percent at this point that, that Entragian was not the first host, right? No, I think that we have seen no clear indication that he was not the first host. I mean, it makes sense. Doesn't, doesn't shock me to learn this, but sure. I, I, I admit that it, the, the thought crossed my mind and maybe I should have said something earlier. So I get credit for it, but I was like, you know, why would, intri- why would the cop be down in the mine? Yeah. 
And, and I should have followed that through and been like, well, he probably wasn't, you know, mm-hmm. he did, like that's, that, that's the logical next yeah. step there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so from here, Matt, we cut to, to tack itself. Chilling, just chilling in the innie. Uh, Ellen Carver's body is is not doing well, uh, but Tack doesn't want to jump too early, doesn't want to waste its limited resources. I guess we should say here, Matt, that we maybe made an assumption too quickly last week. You know, we said as as Ellen Tack grabbed Mary, we're like, oh, there goes any possible confrontation between Ellen and her son and Ellen and her husband. Uh, that still can happen, right? So we can't fully remove that from the board just yet. Yeah, I, I kind of figured that some confrontation would happen. Mm-hmm. I, it would have felt repetitive if it was just like, and, and you know, I mean, well, it's like, what purpose did, did that even serve if, <laughs> if we're not going to, if we're not going to play with that story element, you know? Sure. Yeah. Uh, but the chapter comes to an end as we look out over at the, uh, the, the the well of souls or the well of the world and in in it we see from below deep in the humming red silence of the inny came the wet tongue sound of something slithering so we know that uh the attack is the, the, the version of tack that we're seeing here is just a a a, a like a, 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 be, a being a thing a representation right yeah. um and and we've learned here now that within the well in this as you've called it portal um lies the the full version of the thing that is tack and it's very lovecraftian and terrifying and it's it's really cool actually yeah i mean like i said it's like it's a door and, and um I, I like the idea i mean so so tack we have this this concept of numa sarks mm-hmm. um and then we learn shortly that the way tack transfers is, is literally via the breath, Bre- bre- you know, which Numa means breath. I don't, I don't mm-hmm. actually know if the book literally ever tells us the fact that Numa means breath, right? But <laughs> Numa means breath. Mm-hmm. And so it's like the, he's transferring his Numa, which is sort of, you know, an incorporeal substance, right? So, but maybe the corpus, the, 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 the sarks of tack is actually down in that hole, right? Um, which would be an interesting thing we could explore Mm -hmm. possibly yeah yeah no i like that i like that cool all right let's move into our second chapter uh we move back to david and company for more story time we're gonna get more exposition in this chapter i I love this opening though the man who showed me these things the man who guided me told me to tell you that none of this is destiny it's not ka Matt. his arms were clasped around his knees and his head was bent he seemed to be speaking to his sneakers in a way that's the scariest part Pie's dead, and Mr. Billingsley, and everyone else in desperation, because one man hated the Mining Safety and Health Administration, and another was too curious and hated being tied to his desk. That's all. Yeah. You know, it's it's funny because we talk about the 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 weakness and kind of uselessness of evil and, and its its propensity to self-destruct and self-destroy. But like one thing we should talk about is like also how easy evil has it in that it can just very simply play into the 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 you know desires and and weaknesses and foibles in in all human beings like we meet this guy Carrie Ripton here in the story and he's just this guy who got a little greedy right he just didn't really like the company didn't really like the government and he got a little greedy and said, I wanted I want first crack at exploring this place. And and that's it. All the bad that happens from that point out is because of that one little choice. Yeah, and it's not even like Tack manipulated him into making that choice. There was no, no contact yeah. right at this point. So it really was just this relatively minor sort of pride, you know, the, yeah. the, the sin of pride, I guess you could say. Or, sure, or yeah. I mean, I mean, what it, it, I don't even think it's a sin to be too curious and to hate being tied to your desk, right? That that's just the no, no, that's just I, a I, character I, trait. Yeah, that that's I, I think that is that is the the reason I think in King's explanation of why evil can exist, you know, like this thing that he's developed in, in his in his universe as so weak so it, it will burn itself out in no time how, how but then how does it keep coming and it's like because it can exist in just things like this just yeah 
innocent, like, I just want to explore this on my own. I, I just want to be a little bit greedy, a little bit prideful, a little bit curious. And, and it just, it can latch on to that, just that, that little, that little thing, that little thing you have, it can latch onto it and, and abuse it. And yeah, that's why, that's why dark side's not stronger, Matt, but quicker, easier. Yeah. More seductive. I mean, and, and the, and the world is, is, is fragile. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the dark, the, the darkness is, is also fragile, but it can still do damage while it exists. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, like, so, so we see Carrie, you know, succumbs to, I, I love the, the book frames it as the ghosts of every unfulfilled ambition he has ever held is, is, is how this is framed, which is, which is perfect. Right. Because like, I don't know, you just, you seize opportunities in your life. That's like, Oh, I've always wanted to do something like this. And, and this opportunity falls in my lap and I'm going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course he does. He's possessed by Tack. Uh, we see one of the first things that he does is just kind of wander around town, dropping cantas everywhere. Uh, we don't actually see the effect this has on the town, but we know how these things work. And so, so that perhaps answers the question of how was how was one man, Kali and Trajan, able to murder every single person in desperation? Well, maybe he didn't have to. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like this idea. This is a good. Uh, well, I mean, well, also we saw that the the animals had done a lot of work for people, um, sure. for, for for the for the bad guys rather. Um, sure. Yeah. So yeah, just all, all things considered, I, I really like this element of the of the the cantas though. Like I I can't think of another story that has anything quite like these little animal statues where you pick them up and they turn you insane, and it's like it's it's, it's such a <laughs> interestingly it reminds me so much of what we just talked about where it's like there's no sin in being curious about what's down in a mine <laughs> and there's no sin in being like huh what a cool little statue let me pick mm-hmm. it up and and now it's like you're dead you're dead <laughs> you you picked up you picked up the evil death statue and now you're dead there was no way you could have known that at yeah. all and it's it's and so it can't possibly be your fault really in any moral sense you're still dead though yeah, and that like that's that's the like unfairness of of the of the world, right? That that's yeah. why I think that's why there's this temptation to say God is cruel because he, you know, he allows these things, and it's like, well, yes, but kind of you know, insert all the stuff we talked about at the beginning of this conversation. <laughs> yes, I I think this is great, and, and and I think one really interesting thing about the cantas to me and, and the way they kind of contradict or 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 uh, differ from a lot of the exploration, like there's a lot of stories that have like tokens of power and temptation, right? I mean, like the, the, obviously the, the biggest one that pops to our mind instantly here is the ring of power. Right. But, but these are things that work like slowly over time. And, and these statues, it's instant. It's, it's the second you pick this thing up, the second you pick this thing up, it, 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 it floods your senses and, and almost completely takes you over. Um, instantly right and so yeah it, it's it's this thing that it's not fair it's not playing by any kind of rules there's no there's no lesson to be learned from the statue of like oh i, I was seduced by the power but i was able to pull myself back in time the, the reason why steve and um and, and cynthia are not like aubrey it has nothing to do with their own personal resistance they got a phone call <laughs> they got a phone call from from david at the, the right time because he is he's touched by god so like there's no lesson to these things. It's just, I, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's the, it's the unfair nature of the world. Sometimes you stumble upon a thing and it's just going to fucking kill you. And there's, there's nothing you can do about it. Yep. Exactly. I mean, yeah, the, just the, these, these little, these little choices have had all these horrible consequences for all of our characters and they're yeah. just kind of sitting there shell shocked. Right. And, and yep, yep. none of it really had any, reason that they can see i mean maybe it's all part of some grand plan but Mm -hmm. doesn't do anything for them yeah we we also matt get this little gem and i wanted to talk about this briefly tack is is thinking about how it needs it's going to need its backup to change bodies eventually and it says ripton wants brad on hand and quickly before the black man can be polluted by the cantas the cantas are useful in many ways but they spoil a man or woman for tack's greater work i like this as you know, we can, we can talk about the in, in story meaning of this in a bit, but like, 
as an elegant response to a story problem, I guess semi-elegant response to a story problem you've created, because like we've established that these things, you know, completely take you over. We have Audrey. We know Audrey as the example. And then we have the character of Mary and, and Mary's been captured. And like, you can almost see the note of like, why didn't he just give Mary one of these statues instead of putting her in this room filled with a bunch of scary bugs? Why didn't you just give her a statue? And then she'd be consumed by the statue. And then he could use her later when he wanted to. And it's like, ah, no, 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 no. You can't do statue and tack. At the, you can't do it. Yeah. Problem solved. Yeah. Can't do both. Uh, I, yeah. I like it. I, I do like it. I mean, I, I think um, kind of makes sense if these little demons, you know, we already know that they're shitty little demon creatures uh-huh. that are probably jealous and they're not good with sharing. So the idea that, you know, to, like we see this over and over with King antagonists actually is that like you, you can totally imagine two two demons failing to cooperate in, in a way that would screw them both over, even though if they just cooperated, then at least one of them would survive. Um, and, and also on top of that, we, we've we seen that the demons cause the bodies to fall apart. So like, so like, you know, kind of so what if Tack had tried to take over um, uh I've, the, the the woman who you know fell apart last episode because like she was on the verge of disintegrating anyway so wouldn't mm-hmm. wouldn't have helped but i i, I just I, like to me it just it resonates thematically so I, I don't i don't mind it even if it is sort of a patch no i mean i think that's why it it functions as a good story solve but it just it did still feel like a solve to me of oh sure. i wrote myself in a corner let me write my way out of it um but yeah, no, I, I I agree with you. I think it does work. And yeah, I mean, like the, we see the Cantas kind of burn through a body really, really quickly. We know Tack does as well, but th- these things are of lesser power, lesser strength and lesser control. So they do it even more so. So yeah, right. it does make sense. Yeah, yeah. So Tack Carey calls up his buddy Brad, inviting him down to take pictures of his discovery, and he quickly becomes Tack number two. We do see, as you talked about, that the transfer is done via breath, passing t- Tack on the air between them. I think this is interesting because, like, I don't know, I guess the book kind of sets things up where you assume that the ritual has to be done, like, down in the China pit, perhaps down in the well itself. But I guess that's just not how it works, actually, though, right? Well, that's certainly what I was assuming. Um, and it, 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 instead it's actually quite unclear to me, like why tack brings the people back to this shed. Um, like maybe it, it could matter that it's closer to the any, yeah, perhaps. but, but we don't, we don't know that that's the case. I, I mean, one thing I noticed that jumps out to me more than, more than usual, or, or maybe it's blurred into the background is just the fact that, Tack really does seem to have a lot of little rituals like hanging people up on hooks or propping them up against walls or, or whatever, where it's like um, totally unnecessary. You could just leave, leave the body where it lay, you know, it mm-hmm. doesn't, doesn't do anything. It, it's at, at best, it's like maybe it kind of enjoys the macabre, you know, grotesqueness of what it's doing, but we're not even sure if that's true. It's just like, it has, it has a certain way of doing things. Yeah. And, um, and it's gonna it's gonna do things that way, and, and maybe it's short sighted and dumb, and maybe it leads to its own destruction. But you know, it's it's gonna bring it's gonna bring Mary back to the back back to this location because that's where it did all the other transfers. Maybe like like maybe it's just kind of dumb, you know? Yeah, I also think it's like desire to really hold on to the bodies it's in for as long as possible um, is interesting as well because like I don't know, I understand you know, precious resources and all, but the Ellen body is really disgustingly falling apart at this point. And yeah, like why not just transfer over to Mary now and leave the problem of uh, getting another body to your completely restored self, you know, that's true. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't know that I can provide evidence for this on, on in, in, in the moment, but I kind of feel like tack is also losing its grip on, the plot you know on, on like like what does it want because there's you know what what's about to happen is it sort of goes into the pit and like falls asleep yeah like just rests yeah yeah like it, it just seems to be kind of petering out like it started so strong so so fearsome and and, and smart and quick and dangerous and mm-hmm. it was one step ahead of everyone the whole time and now it's it's lost a step it's lost a few steps i mean at least partly due to its host being weaker but um, 
you got to wonder if that's all there is to it, you know? No, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, I think that we didn't talk about it, but when we see from tax perspective back in the previous chapter, it was like, it realizes now that there was some force here working against him this whole time. It's mm-hmm. like, duh, yeah. duh. <laughs> of course there was. Right. right. Uh, yeah. So he, he takes over Brad and how did you feel about this Tony the Tiger moment? It, it's very, it's very silly. Is it almost too silly? I So I, I kind of loved it because it's, well, this is kind of what I love about this tack entity and this whole mm-hmm. concept is that it's like this great f- fun whipsaw between like an eldritch Cthulhu being. And then as soon as it inhabits this person, it does a Tony, a, a Tony the Tiger, you know, comedy bit because that's the kind of person Brad Josephson is. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's great. Like that's, that's a fun kind of, <laughs> horror actually yeah um it's more than just um you know the thing is a fun horror creature but the thing would never sort of like revel in like screwing around like this where where like (laughs) possesses someone and then like sort of makes a mockery of it you know um because it's that's sort of a cold a, a cold mind creature whereas this is like a, a crazy creature yeah um which is, that just makes it more fun no i like that i like that yeah I don't, I don't mind it either and i think it does fit into the in-universe explanation of it's retaining personality traits and memories from the people that it's inhabiting for sure yeah so so david finishes up his story here and he looks really worn out at this moment i love that johnny looks at him and wonders if god is using up david just like Tack is, is using up his hosts. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you think? What, do you, what, do you, what is your read on that moment? Well, like, yes and no. I mean, David just got the shit beat out of him. Yeah. So that's why he looks the way he does. But also, like, <laughs> why did he get the shit beat out of him? Well, it's because he's being the servant of God, you know? Mm-hmm. And also, like, it's not like God is is literally magically siphoning his spiritual energy, but he is sort of psychologically (laughs) siphoning his spiritual energy due to the things that are happening to him. He is now spiritually wrung out simply by the traumatic experience he's, he's gone through. So, so that's why I say yes and no. It's like not, not, not like supernaturally the way tack uses up its hosts, but like practically speaking sort of, yeah, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like that. I mean, I think that there is a difference in the, in how the two gods in the story go about it, but yeah, they are, they are both really wringing out, um, the, the, the people that they are inhabiting or using. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think the difference is tax seems a little bit more permanent, whereas, whereas David, uh, could possibly recover from this experience in some way. Uh, it's, it's a yeah. different, it's a different kind of used up, I guess. And we've also seen God, perform positive miracles in yeah. a way that that tack never has and, and I, I doubt is capable of sure so you know god could quote unquote use somebody up and then just kind of heal them i'm not saying god would do that but it's possible <laughs> yeah sure sure so johnny asks an important question here matt what does tack want and david's answer is basically it doesn't matter which it's just like, like once again a wild story choice to make here right i mean we kind of sort of know right that it wants to spread chaos it wants to feed but like the story again and again like says don't worry about that it does the, the motivation of the antagonist eh, it doesn't matter don't worry about that all that matters is what god wants and what he wants is for us to go to the china pit all the rest is just story hour yeah which is a wonderful callback but also david yeah but we're it's we're reading the book. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> this is literally story hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, again, yeah. It's it's this. It's King just undermining his own stakes, and it's it's just delightful. And, and, and yeah, and and yet it works, right? Yeah, I think yeah. it's just, this is this is one thing. You know, we talk about how we're reading King through through the ages, and and this is one thing that feels to me like something that is distinctly king with with several decades under his belt now is that he he just feels like he has enough command of the the beat by beat storytelling that he can do things like this and take risks like this that could completely undermine your entire story and just be confident that no 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 this is gonna work trust me trust me this is gonna work yeah exactly it's um you you do have to have a huge amount of experience to do stuff like this and and it's also i suspect pretty easy to screw up too 
Like, yeah. Like, like I can, I can easily imagine like a, you know, younger writer, younger version of Stephen King, like thinking, this is what I'm going to do with this story. I'm going, you know, this, these are what the stakes are. So, so this over here doesn't matter. And I can imagine just screwing it up. Like it's, Mm -hmm. it's it's not easy to do these. He makes it look easy. He makes it look so easy because he's so consistent with the character and with making sure you're tracking with what's going on and what you care about. Um, But like, that's, you know, that that's like the painter who can just like casually jot down, you know, a, a, a landscape that looks perfect. And it's like, yeah, well, this is just a basic skill for someone at, at this level, yeah. but uh, mm-hmm. it's not easy at all. No, definitely not. So Johnny has finally heard enough and he lashes out going hard for David, cutting him right in the worst possible place. He says, you trust him all you want. I guess it's a luxury you can still afford. Your sister's dead and your mother's turned into Christ knows what, but there's still your father to get through before Tack goes to work on you personally. Fucking awful yeah <laughs> holy shit yeah it's uh it's despicable is what it is it is, it is. um yeah the, the only redeeming note is that he himself recognizes that he's behaving despicably yeah yeah which is barely redeeming right like i'm glad he feels horrified when he sees how much he just like stabbed david emotionally there like i'm glad i'm glad you feel horrified that you did that but if like it doesn't change your response to it it, it's meaningless yeah. and 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 so that's like despite feeling horrified he doubles down he continues he doesn't he, he's so scared he's so terrified of of david and what david represents that uh that he he can't he can't back down yeah it's interesting because it's like i agree with you that it's fear but also there's cynicism there like sure there's yeah. a there's a jadedness there's a um world weariness that is sort of he it's almost like yes yes it's fear but it's also like well it's pointless you know the Mm -hmm. the the good guys never win sort of sort of feeling and i feel in this moment like i'm i'm almost like is it the jadedness or is it the fear that's actually driving him here i'm not Hmm. i'm not totally sure interesting yeah no i mean I, i like that i think i think the fear is more textual i think it relates to how terry describes him but yeah no i like that the cynicism i think that fits with what we saw of tack um which is just like good things don't happen everything's bad like every awful like that tack represents the worst possible behavior of all people um, yeah and yeah. that's kind of what he wants. He like like he he is an entity that resists the entire idea of of purpose, of goodness, of meaning. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, that's like he tack is cynicism in a yeah. lot of ways. U- ultimate cynicism. I, yeah. I guess one one question in my mind is like is is Johnny cynical and beat down by life because he's acting out of fear, or is he acting out of fear because he's been beaten down by life? Yeah, we Um, don't really know yet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. David tells him that if he leaves, it's over. The tack wins, which which Johnny just kind of laughs off. And actually, Matt, some of my favorite stuff here in this section is how the text describes Johnny's laughing. Like first, it's just like a short bark of a sound. And then we get this. The sound reminded him of cocktail parties where you laughed that same meaningless laugh at meaningless witticisms while in the background a meaningless little jazz combo played meaningless renditions of meaningless old standards like Do You Know the Way to San Jose and Papa Loves Mambo. It was the way he had been laughing when he climbed out of the pool at the Bel Air, still holding his beer in one hand. But so what? He could laugh any fucking way he wanted to. He had once won the National Book Award after all. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, th- there's some of that cynicism and jadedness yeah. I was talking about because, like, I- I'm not sure. Like, this doesn't really sound like fear. This sounds like a kind of like, well, well, well what does it matter? Nothing matters. Yeah, like, yeah. like it, it, everything's meaningless, and 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 I can take refuge in that meaningless. Yeah, um, this. But but like the other thing, you know, the, the the climbing out of the pool at the cocktail party. Like, I don't know if you remember from earlier in the book. It's been so many weeks ago, but like that was his low point moment. Yeah. Um, when he got pushed into the pool by a a, a a jilted ex, like that was kind of his moment of of realization. And he's just behaving like that way again here. Um, yeah. He's just kind of regressed to that. And I think he says as he walks out of this this van, he's like, I'm done with sobriety. Me and sobriety are done. So he's like fully regressing in these moments, fully giving up. Yeah. 
I, I like this just analysis of, of the laugh. It reminds me of, of this thing my my dad talks about where it's like there's you know there's like you laugh because something's funny, but then a lot of a lot of laughing that happens in social settings is is almost like a sort of primate bark sound <laughs> yeah it's it's like nothing like the sound you make when you when you're watching a comedy movie and you're busting up it's it's mm-hmm. like a and if you if, you know if, if you listen to it from far enough away that you can hear the laughter but not the words it just kind of sounds like a, a pack of chimps communicating in, in grunts and, and barks <laughs> uh-huh. anyway that's a tangent but yeah no i love that there's there's t- so many different kinds of laughs my wife says i have like when i find something really funny she knows Uh, like really really funny it's like i have a a very distinct laugh when something's really really funny yeah yeah sure i think i do too i think Mm -hmm. yeah so steve tries one last time asking johnny what the hell happened what happened to the johnny uh, that he he saw before the guy that went to vietnam without a rifle the guy that walked up to a cougar and took the shot where the hell is that guy johnny says he's gone and then he's gone too he walks out of the truck and on his way yeah, not only is he gone, but like the the moment he was gone was when he fell into the pool, which is this like meaningful, uh, sorry, me- meaningless like uh, nothing event. But it's just for him, it it's this totemic su- moment when when he he realized his life was pointless or something. Um, yeah, but I love I love the the cougar moment being added to this yeah. as well because you know, this, this is a moment that Johnny would not have done on his own, right? Like the reason why he does this is he was kind of guilted and pushed um, by others, the, the people around him. And, and, and what that symbolizes to me is that that person still exists in there somewhere that, 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 that person is still there in you. It's just, you need the people around you to coax that person out. And what he's doing right here is rejecting those people, yeah. those people that could possibly make him the best version of himself. He's running away from them. Yeah. I just want to point out like that there's this wonderful contrast between Steve and Johnny as characters cuz you mm-hmm. know Steve he's just this pragmatic problem solver he's he's very unemotional he doesn't like it, it, he he has a rich internal life but it's mostly oriented around like how do I figure out the situation and not like yeah. how do I tell myself an extremely elaborate tapestry of bullshit and Johnny's just the opposite of all those things and um and so for me, like it, it's, it seems like when Steve is like, man, you suck. Like it, it, it seems, <laughs> it seems to kind of matter to, to Johnny in a way where jo- Johnny, Johnny has to reach for like undercutting Steve and be like, Oh, what, what the fuck do you know? You're just a, a roadie. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, well, like you're, you, you need to attack his credibility or, or his, you know, his sort of like status that way, because you know, that that this guy is actually like more competent than you actually yeah um and you can't stand that i agree uh, sa- same thing he does with terry right that mm-hmm. that idea of like i'm your intellectual better because yeah. you have to you you can't refute the claims the people are making so you have to destroy the person because that's the only only way you can operate yeah, yeah exactly um if i do have a critique of this book though in that I, I do not think this is a perfect story. I do think like in, in all this, this great, great, great David, Johnny, you know, jockeying, I feel like the other characters get lost a little bit. Again, uh-huh. I, I've commented on this before, right? But Cynthia is there. <laughs> she's, she's here in the room. Uh, Ralph is here in the room too. Steve is, is, is here. I think Steve has a little bit more to do, but like, as far as like their journey through this story, it's very thin. Like there's, there's a little bit of it. There's some good moments, but it's definitely not the focus of this, this book at all is these other characters. I feel like they get a little lost. I have to say, I love the moment when Cynthia like literally attacks Johnny physically when he, when he, uh, uh, mouths off to David. But, but yes, I mean, you know, you, you told me Cynthia is like an important character for another book and I'm, I, I think thin is a good word where I'm just like, ever since we kind of uh, uh, connected up Steve and Cynthia with the rest of the group, I don't feel like we've moved the football forward for Steve or Cynthia. Yeah. Really. Yet. Like, except in, in little tiny strokes around the margins. Right. Yeah. Which is, which maybe that's fine. Like maybe that's enough. Yeah. I don't know. Cause sometimes you have to stand back from the book in the end and say, yeah, like, like you, you, you set them up, 
they played their role and then they got their resolution. Maybe that's what, you know, maybe it'll all turn out great. But yeah, I, I agree with your sentiment that like right now it's just like, oh yeah, uh, 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 what's his name? St- Steve. Yeah, Steve. Yeah. It's like, um, yeah. I mean, the reason th- that this stuck out, stuck out to me this time is because I think r- before Johnny says he leaves, he's like talking to the two of them and he's basically like, you, you two seem like you got something good going on here. If you stay here, you're going to ruin that. And, and my response was like, do they? <laughs> uh-huh. we, we've been we've been so far removed from Cynthia and Steve, like outside of the fact that the book kind of treats them as a single unit a lot in in reactions to things. It's like, are, are they, is, is something really blossoming here? Like, really? Like, really? Um, we just don't spend a lot of time with them. I don't I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you're right that, that this is the type of thing we have to assess once everything is said and done. But I mean, this is just not the first time in this book that I've I've kind of lost the extraneous characters as we've focused in on the the Johnny and and David of it all, which is which is clearly the driving force of the novel. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, so the, so the rest of them watch uh, Johnny walk away, but David finds Johnny's wallet, which somehow mysteriously fell out of his pocket while he was bending over earlier. I, did you like, I love how the text kind of does this, Matt. It just highlights this as a thing uh-huh. before we have meaning behind it. Right. It's just like Johnny bent over, get the drink and oop, his wallet fell out. And I wonder like if that set off alarms in Matt's head of like wallet, wallet. That's, that's important. The book's telling me that's important. Or if you just like completely went by it. I think I basically completely went by it at the time because I was like, it, it's just like, okay, all right. <laughs> like I, I guess something's probably going to happen with it, but I, it didn't strike me as like this will be a, a hinge that the plot revolves around. No, that's fair. Oh. That's fair. I mean, it's like the, the text almost like needs to acknowledge it happens, but it doesn't want you to think about it too much until it wants you to later. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. So David picks up the wallet and feels this incredibly powerful shock, um, a message from God that this is important. So he, he's compelled to start leafing through it and he finds uh, pictures. Uh, kids, um, back in the old days, uh, wallets were much bigger than they are now because uh-huh. it's not just a, a, a thing that holds your one credit card and, and ID. Uh-huh. Um, and we didn't have phones. And so we would print out pictures on a, a little little pieces of uh i don't what photo paper sure i i, I guess yeah it's it's uh, more like plastic called, really called them wallets because they're wallet sized pictures and we put them in there so okay kids now you're caught up with us yeah that's why there's pictures in the wallet yeah <laughs> it's not talking about his, his apple wallet <laughs> one day matt people are gonna actually have to explain this so i'm yeah i'm semi joking but but semi not I know it's uh it's true it's true it's archaic but, but the thing we find here Matt is uh a picture of of a very young Johnny Marinville wearing a Yankees cap jeans and a gray t-shirt hey wait that's the guy that David saw and talked to in the land of dead the one who guided him the one who instructed him on everything we've just learned over the past few chapters um what's more the, the place that this picture is taken is called the Viet Cong lookout. Matt, what, what the fuck is going on? I, I legit just sat and thought about this for a solid five minutes and I, and, and I don't really have a clue. Um, <laughs> like, I, I mean, are we, are we to take this literally that Johnny psychically sent himself forward in time or is this more metaphorical or I, I don't really know. I don't really know what we're doing here. Yeah, because the land of the dead is for the dead. Why is he there? I mean, he tried to kill. Okay, well, maybe this clicked. Is he tried to kill himself when he was that age, whatever, wherever that picture was taken, mm-hmm. and because of magic reasons, um, <laughs> like part of his soul is you know remained in in the land of the dead, and um, you know the rest of him, but whatever that means. <laughs> uh, oh no, 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 because he's like stuck. Right, this is kind of a like stuck in it. the 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 place i don't know man the point is him, him trying to kill himself resulted in part of him ending up in, in the land of the dead sort of yeah. petrified at that point yeah i mean once again terry says you're not really living anymore it's, so. it's it's really weird to me how i will i will actually think very hard about these questions while we're while i'm writing the script ponder <laughs> them even and then we're talking 
and I just like am, am babbling and then I just like stumble upon something and I'm like, oh yeah, that's it. That's what it is. hundred um, percent. I don't really, there's something weird about the process of like just letting yourself talk is, 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 is that's kind of interesting actually. That's the way, I mean, we've done, done this for so long, like talking out loud is literally the way we think now. So it's true. <laughs> because we're just better at it when we're talking it out. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. No, I, 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 I like that. I think this is really interesting. Here, here's a hint I'll give to you and all, all future uh, readers of Stephen King. Uh, uh, Stephen King it loves baseball, um, and his team is the Boston Red Sox. Uh, the arch enemy of the Boston Red, Red Sox are the New York Yankees. I am a New York Mets fan, and so I also hate uh, the New York Yankees, and uh, uh, also myself because I'm a Mets fan, and, and that's all Mets fans hate ourselves. That's why sure. we're Mets fans. Sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, so so if a character is wearing a Yankees hat in a Stephen King book, it's probably a character that Stephen King doesn't like too much, <laughs> which which yeah. I think is a perfect explanation for Johnny. Right. Yeah. Like, I think I think, you know, we talked about Johnny as a, a king surrogate you know, very early in the novel. And, and it's not, not that right. But I think Johnny is a, a, a construct of a a version of himself that king absolutely despises like that that like the, a, a path he could have taken and the type of author he could have been perhaps the type of author he's interacted with in in this business like and he he, he hates this guy like I, I legitimately think king hates this guy he loves him too he's he's as torn on johnny as we are torn on johnny i think that comes through in the text and giving him a yankees cat is like the perfect capper on this it's like fuck fuck this fucking yankees fan i hate him yeah yeah I- yeah, I, I agree with all that. I mean, I think also there's parts of Marinville in, in King, and he, he doesn't like those parts of himself. Oh, definitely, um, yeah. Too, but uh, yeah, I, I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's a cheat code for any future uh, King novel, Matt. Uh, Yankees cap? Ooh, okay. Pay attention. Yeah. Yeah. No good. No good this guy is. Yeah. Yep. Uh, all right. So we briefly leave David behind and cut back to Mary, still screaming at the reality of her situation. Mary drops to her knees and the act actually gives her strength, Matt. It reminds her of David praying. And so she does something that she hasn't done in years. She prays herself and she gets an immediate response. A clear voice spoke in her head and not her own voice either. She was pretty sure of it. It was as if someone had just been waiting and not very patiently for her to speak first. This is a great moment. It's very satisfying. (laughs) It is so great. Like I've been waiting. I've been waiting. Come on. Yeah. Just ask yeah. me for help. And and we've sort of been waiting for God to like actually be helpful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. But I I think this is interesting though because I did notice this as I was going through the notes. I went back to the first Mary section while she's wandering around in the dark, and and she says the phrase "Please God" multiple times. She says "Please God, help me." Please God. Uh, let me get out of here. Please, God, don't let me die. She says this multiple times in that section. But that's not prayer, right? Uh, and, and I do think there is something very specific to what we're doing here. Like the choice to pray in this way, the choice to reach out in this way. We've talked about how like the language of Christianity has so infused itself in the way we talk in everyday life, whether you believe in God or don't, right? Like the, the, the phrase please God has just become a phrase in, in, in modern vernacular when we're not actually saying like, God, please. It's yeah. just, it's just a thing we say, right? Like it, it just the same with, with the, the Catholics saying the, the apostles creed, like none of those words mean anything to us anymore. We're just saying them. And, and so, yeah, I think we're doing something very specific with this idea of this, this, it, it's not even the getting down on the knees part of it. It's just the, the in, intentional opening of dialogue um you know spiritual dialogue obviously we don't you don't actually need to say things out loud but like this is this there's something here right yeah um i i feel like uh, i I rather i i enjoy um the idea that that prayer is sort of being portrayed as this intentional act it's not just like Mm -hmm. you you mouth the words it's like you have to put yourself in this explicit sort of open maybe slightly subservient position and, and you have to directly ask and and wait for an answer or or, or be mm-hmm. open to the idea that an answer could come um and uh and, and that to me feels you know it, it does it does feel like something to pray 
rather than just kind of mouth the words, you know? Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's what King is touching on here. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, and, and, and I love that what God tells Mary in this moment is something that like, she probably could have just figured out for herself already. Right. Like uh-huh. the, the way in which, which God helps in this moment is not direct. It, it, it's more, I'm going to help you help yourself. Um, because what God says here is that, Hey, you're safe. Nothing here is going to hurt you. You know this because Tack needs your body and he needs your body in good shape. So he can't have a bunch of spiders bite you. He can't have a bunch of rattlesnakes put poison into you. He needs you. So none of these animals are going to touch you. Um, that doesn't make it any less scary, but it, it it is true. I'm not I'm not going to protect you from these animals. You're not going to have a, a, a Daniel lion bubble around you. But like none of this stuff can hurt you. So don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's literally just uh, information. It's mm-hmm. it, well, so that, that that's the funny thing is at least that's how it seems because and, and I say that because it reminds me of God, you know, impatiently, disinterestedly being like the soap. And then David mm-hmm. lathers himself up and squeezes out through the bars. And then it's only afterward that everyone's like, how the fuck did that kid get his head out of the bars? That doesn't make any sense. And then you're like, yeah. And it's like, <laughs> there's, for all we know, it's like, it just, it seems like God is just saying like, yeah, they're not going to hurt you. And Mary's like, oh, oh, okay. And it's like, maybe only later will it, you know, if ever, will, will it ever occur to us of like, wait a second, how did like, there had to be like a hole for her to crawl out of. Right. So like, where'd that come from or, or, mm-hmm. or something else that I'm not even thinking of. Right? Or it's just gonna be the same thing where like someone's going to look at the hole from the, the dryer vent and be like, you can't fit through that hole. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. <laughs> something like, or, or, you know, she falls out of the hole. I, I forget what the distances are, but I felt like she falls out of the hole onto the corpses and it's like, yeah. well, if the corpses hadn't been, like, the corpses are gross obviously, but they cushioned her fall. I, I, I think unless I'm misunderstanding like the physics of the situation. Look, um, man, Here's all I know. God helps in two very specific ways. He makes smelly fish last longer uh-huh. and he makes you fit through holes you can't normally fit through. The, that's the, all he can do. Those it's are those his two, two powers. Things. Yeah. That's it. Those are the powers. That would be a fun like D&D character. <laughs> <laughs> See how far you can get with that. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so I don't think you would get very far. Your, the like, DM just imagine. keeps throwing puzzles at you that involve <laughs> feeding people or getting out of tight spaces. How many times during that thing would you roll a d20 and say, I search for a hole? Yeah. Uh, he finds a hole. Damn it. <laughs> um, okay. So so Mary, uh, as we said, like finds the kind of exhaust pipe for the dryer and is able to enlarge it at just enough to where... She is able to slip through. She drops down onto a pile of corpses from Tack's original massacre of of the the mining company. And so, in conclusion, God is gross. Uh God is gross. God is gross. God has a sense of humor. Yeah. Uh, Mary attempts to jump into Entragian's car, but finds the keys missing. I do kind of love, like, Mary's initial shock and terror at seeing the cruiser. You know, like it brings us back to one of the things I think we were doing early in the book, which is making a specific commentary on the interaction between, you know, civilians and police. And now Mary has this very specific and acute fear of just seeing a cop car. That's probably not going to go away uh, if she manages to live through uh, her time in desperation. Yeah, I agree. But I also wanted to call this out. So I don't know. This just really jumped off the page to me. She's kind of crawling away and thinking to herself, and we see here, a little over a year ago, she had read poems as part of a cultural event called Women Poets Celebrate Their Sense and Sexuality. She had worn a suit from Donna Karen and a silk blouse underneath. Her hair had been freshly done, feathered in bangs across her brow. Her long poem, My Vase, had been quite the hit of the evening. Of course, all that had been before her visit to the historical and beautiful China Pit, home to the uniquely and fascinating rattlestick rattlesnake number two mine she doubted if any other people who had heard her read my vase uh, at that event would recognize her now she no longer recognized herself and we do we get a bit we get a little bit of the poem here matt uh, in the middle of that it's 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 a little bit of of my vase or my vase how are you gonna say it um i i just this really jumped out of me because like this is not the first time in this book we've had a a woman character comment on 
you know, that how how this event has utterly transformed them as a person. How mm-hmm. you know the, they they were they were this one person this they they this one thing, and now I've been utterly transformed, and I I would not even recognize myself. Like Ellen had a very similar thing as she was being driven to the China Pit to to become Tack, right? Like this, the, and and so you know when you start having things repeat multiple times in books, you're like, okay, what are we doing here with this? Because we're we're calling this out very specifically. What are we doing with it? Yeah. Um, I think it ties into this idea of, of, you know, life isn't just avoiding pain. Um, mm-hmm. and, and like, you know, even if Johnny were to successfully escape from this situation, which I don't think he will, um, it's not like he would go back to being the Johnny who he was before he got pulled over by an He would, mm. he would be forever changed by it. And that's, you know, that, that's, that's the, the substance of life is, is actually these events they can be good or bad, but, but, but there is no such thing as stasis. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't think that I have it quite dialed in actually everything I just said. It's like, yeah, I think that's true, but I don't think that's all of it. So, yeah. Um, I, I think one, one, one thing that jumps out to me about this bit that you've just read is like, there's a lot of focus. There's a lot of specific focus from our characters on how like relatively meaningless their lives were before. Mm-hmm. And that feels kind of harsh. Cause like, I don't think my life is, you know, meaningless and, and my life probably looks like these, you know, normal American people here. Um, but like what I mean is like relatively meaningless. I don't routinely confront demonic forces. So <laughs> it's all a matter of perspective. Um, and, and like once you've sort of touched upon the true horrifying nature of reality, uh, your your life is is transformed. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I like that. I mean, it's it's I wonder I I don't want to be mean to a fictional character's poetry or anything, but like it it is really interesting that like the most popular poem was this poem about her vase, which is, you know, the shape, the form of a woman. The the po- the poetry itself, you know, compares the the shape of this thing to the shape of a woman right you know smooth sided fragrance of stems brimmed with shadows curved like the line of a shoulder the line of a thigh you know this is this is it's it's, it's woman shaped the vase is her um which is a thing yeah. that is very fragile right um right it is it is a very breakable fragile thing um and brimmed brimmed with shadows i love that and this this description of herself that is i don't i don't know like not inaccurate but also like you haven't really gone through anything and and like i, I don't like there's something to be like this is the poetry you write when you haven't really experienced much of anything it's just like i'm comparing myself to a, a thing that holds flowers yeah and it's the most popular poem at my event i mean in, in a very different way it reminds me of johnny's need to constantly talk about how awesome he is it, mm-hmm. this is just sort of a different way of doing that where it's like i was I was beautiful and I was appreciated for my wit and charm yeah. and, 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 and now look at me and, and, um, uh, I, you know, I think her reaction to the situation is very different from Johnny's. That's part of why it, it feels different, but it's definitely something that she's, um, she's experiencing it as a loss essentially. While I don't, I don't think Johnny's experiencing it as a loss because he's kind of in denial about the whole thing, whereas yeah. she's accepted it. I, I think you fit the crux of this and, and, I agree she is experiencing it as a loss, but it's not a loss that Mary is really like f- completely el- like absorbed in. Yeah. Um like I think there there is an interesting comparison to be made with Johnny here and 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 you can perhaps assume that Johnny has gone through some shit in his life. You know, we know he went to Vietnam. Yes, he went not as a soldier as a writer, but he experienced some things there for sure. And, and and this the type of events that Mary is going through right now is perhaps an event that Johnny went through, you know, not obviously not exactly the same, but a traumatic event that changed and shaped him. And it, it, the the event itself matters, but also your reaction to the event matters. And, and Mary here in this moment, in this moment right before she's about to like make this incredibly heroic, uh, Herculean climb up a, a the side of a mining pit with a monster chasing after her is like pointing out, huh, I, you, I wouldn't recognize myself, but she's not doing that as like, that's horrible. I hate this. I hate that I'm changed now. It's just like, 
oh, I'm different now. Like, I, I, I've been transformed. Uh, I, maybe, maybe I would not describe myself as a, a vase of us anymore. Yeah. Um, I am something different. I like and, that. and that, and that is a reflection of, of, of the way cruelty can be refining and, 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 and be absorbed in a good way. Um, because I, we don't, we don't know what's going to happen with Mary, but it seems like at the end of this week's reading, she gets away for now and, and, and people are on their way to save her. So maybe she's going to make it out of this alive. And good that's good and so maybe this is a positive thing we're saying here like this this is this is the way to react to the bad things in your life that will happen to you everyone has bad stuff to happen in their life this is the good way to react to it say hey i'm not that person anymore i i do kind of mourn the loss of that person but it is what it is yeah i mean another another comparison that jumps out to me is is um to sort of a similar feeling moment from from ellie um which happened when she was in um, in Trajan's car, mm-hmm. but the difference there was that it was like she was um, not accepting. It, 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 uh, this was weeks ago, so I'm probably not going <laughs> to draw a beat on it perfectly. But it was more like she felt like this couldn't be real, whereas yeah. Mary, you know, in contrast, is has accepted her reality and her reality sucks and she hates it but she's accepted it that this is her new reality and um and maybe there's meant to be a contrast there because we really like we literally had two two different you know women who were who were captured by Entragian and then we got to compare and contrast their reactions yeah i was uh, desperately trying to find that section while you were talking and i wasn't able to i wanted to read some of it but uh, what i'm going to do is is put a pin in this and we'll circle back around to this in the overview episode because i, I definitely cool. want to put these two these two things side by side and this isn't the first time mary has done this by the way she also as they were climbing into uh the american west theater she had like a similar like oh i'm a different person now but yeah i i I think i think the strength of mary as a character is that she's kind of rolling with this yeah um yeah yeah sad about it sure Uh, mourning the loss of that person sure but but you know accepting it right right so mary realizing the tack will be coming soon starts trudging up the wall of the China pit to get the hell out of there. And that's where chapter two ends. And we move Matt into our final chapter of the week. Chapter three. Uh, this is a short one, actually it's like 15 pages long. And it feels like one of those setting the stage for the finale chapters, right? Like, like we kind of jump very quickly between all of our characters. There's, there's characters all in different places. We jump, jump between them very, very rapidly and just do this. Let's get all the people in their place. Uh, as we can move into the climax that's the kind of chapter this is yeah um page turner again right sure yeah oh definitely definitely yeah this these 15 pages really really move yeah we begin the chapter with johnny now in the, the quonset hut trying to work up the courage to go through the pockets of the corpses hanging on the wall for their keys he can't get over the fact that one of the corpses sir seems to look a lot like his ex-wife terry uh and so much so that she'll start talking to him later yeah, the story makes the point that it looks a lot like Terry. Like, yeah, to the point where it's like some, something, perhaps something is going on here. Yeah, not something magical, yeah. Uh, speaking of the thing we talked about before, I'm just going to read this sentence again because it makes me laugh. With any luck, John Edward Marinville, the man Harper's had once called the only white male writer in America who matters, <laughs> would be gone. <laughs> oh, what, God. what a hilarious sentence. Yeah, it, the only white male writer in America who matters. It is hilarious. It is it's great. A lot of clarifications on that to make it so you matter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, once again, I, I, <laughs> we, we harped on it a bit this episode, but it's, it's, how often does he think something like this? Where it's yep. basically, it basically boils down to like reminding himself. People think I'm important. People think I'm important. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm so important. People think I'm important, and it, it's constant. Matt, I'm the only white male podcaster in this room that matters right now. So, well, whew. I, I genuinely hope that's able to get you through the next hour or so, Scott. <laughs> oh, it will. Don't you worry. All right. So David's words and actions are kind of haunting Johnny a little bit here. He, he it, it keeps circling back around to the things he said and the things David has done, but he keeps pushing it off, ex- explaining it away, running from it. And that's where we get this really wonderful line from 
quote unquote Terry that says, tell me something, Johnny. When exactly was it that you decided to deal with your fear of dying by giving up real life completely? You didn't even give up living for writing. That would at least have been understandable, if contemptible. You gave up living for talking about writing. I mean, Jesus, Johnny. Hey, wait. All we do is talk about. <laughs> well, but you see, it's um, shut it's up. Different. It's different. Yeah. It's different because we didn't get. We're. I'm living, man. I'm. I'm, I'm living. That's that's right. I'm the most important person. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's okay, Scott. It's okay. I, I, I I don't think, yeah, no, no, this is not, Stephen King was not reaching uh, into the future to insult us personally with this. Probably Uh, not. Prob, probably. (laughs) (laughs) I I do want to point out here that, uh, something we already talked about that, that Johnny's land of the dead counterpart had, had scars on his wrists. So yes, you know, that person before we knew them as Johnny knew them as a person who uh, attempted. And at that point we had reasoned perhaps succeeded in taking their life. Yeah. I mean, in retrospect, you think about it being scars on the wrists. It seems like if he were in land of the dead, then he would have had like cut wrists, you know, not scars. Scar- mm, scars fair. suggest that they healed meaning. Well, that's fair. As it, it was a, it was a clue maybe that was there if you if you were there to pick it up it was minor but um it's an interesting thought yeah i i, I did want to circle back around we should have talked about this when we talked about the reveal but like i i know last week you had said i feel like i should know who this person is and i just don't know if there exists enough in this book to make that logical leap yeah before it tells you to and i, I don't mean, think the book wants you to really no I, I mean, I agree. I I don't think I, I don't think I would have even if you had given me some some hints short of just kind of telling me. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, uh, but, but I think the book the book frames the character in a way where it's like this is a character you're supposed to pay attention to, which makes you begin asking like, okay, why? Like, either yeah. we're gonna meet them later, or we've met them before, or I should. That's why I said I maybe I know them from some other book. I just feel like we're our attention is being drawn in that specific way that feels like you know notice this character yeah i agree with that i agree yeah yeah but yeah i I do not fault you for not guessing because i certainly didn't well thank you (laughs) um so johnny is is interrupted by his thoughts by uh it's a giant fucking wolf Uh and it's charging him oh so we'll deal with that later. Uh, we cut over to Tack, <laughs> who has woken up from his little, little nap ski uh-huh. uh, to realize things aren't <laughs> quite going going his way. Um, he's he's in this moment, like trying to manage, like sending the wolf after Johnny while still spying on David. And then he realizes that his spare battery has flown the coop. And Matt, I don't know about you. Like one of the things I love so much about the ending of King books is watching as everything collapses around the bad guys due primarily to their own stupid incompetence. It's delightful to read. Fuck you, Tack. Ha ha. You suck. Yeah. It never gets old. Never gets old. <laughs> Fucking loser. Yeah. Just imagine right before the final confrontation, you're just like, I'm just going to take a little nap. Oh, no. Oh, they're all in different places. And um, <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, that's great. It's wonderful. Tack chases after Mary, even as the body of Ellen Carver begins to deteriorate. So, like, we're about to do a discussion question, Matt, uh, about, like, this thing specifically. But we've kind of shied away from directly talking about how frequently gross this entire book is. Like Ellen Carver uh, had a yeast infection, and that yeast infection uh, has turned with 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 toxification into just bleeding uh-huh. out of everywhere. Yeah, and, and we get lo- lots of very descriptive writing in this story about how she's like squishing around constantly. Yeah, yeah, it, it, you know, in really creative ways, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I feel like I've consumed a lot of zombie fiction, mostly in the form of films. And this book has forced me to think more about the mundane reality of existing inside a body that is rotting um, 
than all of the other zombie fiction combined because mm-hmm. it's like yeah the practical realities of like it, make, it makes it kind of harder to to do stuff when you're when you're you know falling apart and slick and wet and Ugh. making squishing scorping sounds wherever you move That's like so these the, the, but like there are practical consequences to these things, right? I, sure. I think that's really great. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so Tack uses a, a bat to sense how far away Mary is and then goes running up the China pit wall after her. We cut over to Mary, still climbing, rapidly approaching exhaustion and being harried by that dumb spy bat. When uh-huh. suddenly she hears Ellen, who is getting closer and closer, call out to her. Mary runs as fast as she can, finally gets to the top. Tack is right on her heels. She sprints towards the town, and that's and then we leave we leave them, we leave yeah. them behind. Like that that summary paragraph you just read was one of my favorite parts of the whole book, honestly. <laughs> it's one of my favorite King moments ever, possibly. Like oh, the, really? The the description of Ellen Tack scrambling up like trying to scramble up this this rock wall in this like you know fast zombie body that's also decaying and bleeding everywhere with her mouth like jammed open wide and like frothing blood and like gurgling blood through her breath (laughs) and like staring at her with these like inhuman eyes it it, love every molecule of this it's just (laughs) the most creepy original interesting terrifying fun chase scene ever i I love it so much you're you're a little bit of a freak huh (laughs) yeah (laughs) you learn something new every day i'm i'm surprised that you didn't know this yet i'm just kidding yeah yeah no i i agree (laughs) it's very fun it's very tense you know like i think the, the cool thing about the way they positioned mary in this book is like we don't really necessarily know like what what her role in the in the overall theming of the story is like we just had that long conversation where we maybe like supposed some things but we don't know so like this chase is on and we don't know what's going to happen here is she she going to catch her is she not we don't know yeah Um, yeah. it's it's very tense it's very well written it's very fun um it's incredibly gross (laughs) yeah you could, could have very well caught her um yeah totally yeah uh so we move back to david with his apostles um, after realizing that Johnny was the messenger from God, David is suddenly determined to go find him and return his wallet. What's more, Matt, he says he's going alone. He orders the the group to go find Mary, who he somehow is able to know uh, is heading their way and needing help. And uh, despite some protesting by m- mostly his father, uh, they all agree. And they, as he walks off, they go look for Mary we get this line, the last line of our chapter. All right, Ralph said, we'll leave God to protect my kid until we get back. He jumped off the back of the truck and looking grimly down the street. It'll have to be God. That bastard Marinville sure won't do it. And here That's we great. go. Here we go. My favorite bit in this is is when Steve, um, I think it's Steve. It might be, it might be Cynthia. Anyway, it, it is Steve. Yeah, it is Steve, Steve for the first time sees the son in the father. Or yeah, sees the son in the father. Because normally, yeah. I, I just love that turn of phrase because it's like normally you see the you see the father in the son, but it's like Ralph's been such a a milk toast guy so far that yeah. f- finally some of that steel is actually showing through. Yeah, I agree. It's great. Um, and and it, it would be. <laughs> I'm trying not to be too mean. It would be so much more effective for me if if Ralph was an entity in this book at all which he just is barely um, like, if I, I don't care about Ralph as a character really in the story. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I, I, I guess to, to, to maybe argue from like where King's head is at here. It's like, well, yeah, he's, he's boring. He's, <laughs> he's not doing anything. Like that's the point actually. Like, sure. like, do you want regular notes that are like Ralph continued to sit there? <laughs> No, well, definitely and, not. And because, like, and so, so the point is, like, while I, I get what you're saying about, like, it just kind of feeling weird that certain characters are driving the whole thing and other ones are just kind of sitting there. It's like, well, that's, that's what's going on with them. Is <laughs> there, yeah. They're, 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 so, makes sense, I guess. Yeah. I, I guess, I, I agree. Um, I guess what I would think is, is maybe we could have a little bit more internality with him. Like, I feel like, I feel like we did a thing very early in the book about the two kids kind of, or the two adults reacting to their son's 
quote unquote God thing and reacting with it differently, but also with like confusion and mild concern. And I feel like we just kind of abandoned that. And we, we see like the most we, we see it from Ralph is like external when he's like, no, David, don't no, D- D- David, no. Uh-huh. And, and I guess like uh, pro- perhaps a better version of this character in my mind would be one where we get to really, we get to really see how Ralph transforms from that guy to the one that we see here at the end of this, where, you know, we see the son and the father where we see, we see the strength in him that he allows his son to go that he, he like, you know, is, you know, it, if, if we're doing the Jesus metaphor again, you know, this is, this is Joseph and Mary, um, you know, allowing their son to go or not, not allowing, but like knowing their son has to go do this thing. And, and having the strength to to trust in it, I guess. Yeah. And I, I guess I would have liked to have seen that internal transformation a little bit more. Sure. I, I feel you there. I agree. But uh, th- uh, like these critiques, I think, are pretty mild. I am enjoying the book a lot overall. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That is it for this week. Next week, Matt, we're finishing the book. It's all it's, 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 it's just got a little bit more. All and right. we'll figure out if God is cruel or not. All right. Can't wait. <laughs> Before we go for the week, though, we do have last week's discussion question. I hope no one is eating because it's about to get real gross. Matt, what was <laughs> what was our question last week? What is your favorite instance of incredible gross body collapse slash decomposition in oh. film, TV, book, books? Et All right, let's do it. Let's do it. All right, from Kasha Koo, uh, one of the most fun ones I can think of is in RoboCop. Boddicker and crew lay a trap for RoboCop and Lewis at the steel mill. As they chase them around, one of Boddicker's henchmen accidentally drives right into a vat of toxic chemicals that begins to melt his body. Over the next minute, you see the henchman stagger around begging for help as his skin begins to droop off his body before wandering in front of Boddicker's speeding car and getting liquefied all over the windshield. It's a great little bit of body horror in an awesome action film for the 80s. Man, we don't do shit like this anymore. The 80s were a great time. They were. Why don't we do shit like this anymore? I don't know. Because it's people don't like it anymore. People don't like sex. People don't like melting people. This is such a lame generation. Everything is worse now. <laughs> uh, next, we have J-Dub775. I just thought I should leave that completely uncommented on. Cause yeah, yeah. Uh, Jdub 7785 says, when the goon in Robocop runs his truck into the toxic waste and his ladder splattered during the car chase. Perfect. There it is again. It's still right. Yep. It's all right. I love Robocop. Me too. Felidal says, Jeff Goldblum's gross gooey disintegration as a housefly human hybrid in David Cronenberg's 1986 body horror film, The Fly. I have no idea how this happened, but for some reason I was able to watch this movie when I was about six or eight years old. <laughs> um, note from, from me, Matt. Yeah, me too, somehow. Um, (laughs) My my parents must have been taking the day off. The movie embedding itself in my subconscious might actually go a long way to explaining why I've been a lifelong Stephen King horror fan. Anyway, in this film, Goldblum plays a scientist who invents a teleportation device that can transport objects between two pods by deconstructing the object on a molecular level and reconstructing it in the other pod. One day, he tests the teleportation on himself, unaware that there's a fly in the pod with him, causing the device to disintegrate them both and then reintegrate them as one being. The merging of the fly DNA into Goldblum's body gradually drives him insane and causes him to mutate into a shambling, oozing monstrosity capable of climbing on walls and vomiting up corrosive digestive enzymes that melt human flesh into a bloody slurry. CGI is great and all, but there's really nothing like the practical gore effects of the 80s. This is this is the answer. This is the answer I was thinking of when we asked this question. It's my answer. It's uh-huh. it's it's the best um yeah i i called you a little freak earlier uh-huh. um man i'm 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 a little freak too yeah i know uh <laughs> this i saw this movie very young too i don't know if i was six six seven or eight but i was very young and like i realized i was weird when like brundlefly pulling his uh fingernails off and like pulling his teeth out i'm like I like this. Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> this is gross, but I I like it. I mm. I want to watch more of this. Uh, it's great. It's so gross, but it's oh, it's so good. To I need me, to rewatch the fly. To me, like the most viscerally upsetting part was when 
um, he he's fighting the the guy at the end, and he like vomits on the guy's hand, oh. and the hand just like dissolves into a bloody it's, nub, it's so and, and and like the guy the guy is like watching it happen to his own hand, and that made it even more like upsetting. You know, it's it's really good. So good. Uh, Pear Jane says, there's only one answer for this for me. Jack's decomposition in a, an American werewolf in London. When David and Jack are attacked on the moors, poor Jack is mauled to death and then doomed to roam the earth until the werewolf's line ends. He uses that time by visiting David and telling him to kill himself. I shared American werewolf with my kids, one of whom is a horror buff, and neither of them could make it past Jack's first appearance. Horrible, bloody claw marks rake down his face, and this one tiny flap of skin dangles from his jawline and wobbles when he talks. Yep, they both noped out. <laughs> Jack's first plea with David doesn't work, so he returns later with green skin that blackens around the edges. By his last visit, when he's accompanied by David's other mauling victims in equally gross stages of decomposition, he's pretty much just scraps of flesh clinging bravely to his skull. Kids today might scoff at the special effects work. His final appearance is stop motion or animatronic, but it was so advanced in 1981 that it won Rick Baker the first ever Academy Award for best makeup and hairstyling. And the biggest kudos to Griffin Dunn, who somehow manages to play a decomposing zombie with all the charm and good humor of a college student. <laughs> a college student would want in a BFF. That's great. Yeah. Uh, I love that answer. Um, I mean, American Werewolf in London is great also for like one of the most gnarly, wonderful werewolf transformations ever. Yeah. Uh, again, this goes into me being a little freak, but I just I love that so much. Yeah. No, it's funny because I kind of thought the werewolf transformation was what Pear Jane was going to mention at first. Mm -hmm. And then it's, and then I realized, I mean, I, I do love this answer because like there, there's, you know, they didn't have to have the decay progress between scenes. It just yeah. adds a little bit of delightful flavor to show that this, this, this dead corpse is, is actually rotting and decomposing as the movie progresses. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, you're it's, right. It's really good. Uh, Karina 2020 says, um, I immediately thought of the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark and the Nazis melting and exploding for looking at the Ark when opened. It looks a bit cheeseball today, but back then I remember thinking it was so disgusting. Such a great It was. I, I, think, I think there's... Yeah, I, this sounds stupid, but I think that like the, the badness of old special effects was actually good and worked yeah. better than them looking like perfectly photorealistic. Because there's, it's just, I don't know. There's something about it that sticks with you more. Because like the the offness actually is more memorable in some way. I agree. I agree. We're about to uh, read an answer about thing, the thing here, and yeah. like the special effects in the thing are not perfect, right? They don't mm. look quote unquote real, but they are effective because almost because they're unreal. Because it looks so unreal, yeah, it makes it more scary. I agree. And weird and oddly enjoyable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's so next to uh, Tara. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Says you got to be fucking kidding from the thing. If you think anything but the spider head from the thing, although any iteration of the thing would do for me. They really went all out making every practical effect as gory, slimy and uncanny as possible. Yeah. And uncanny. You know, that's the word. Uncanny. Uh, uncanny. It is uncanny and therefore more uncomfortable and gross and wonderful. And the weird thing is, like, for somehow I, I really don't feel like I can think of any CGI monster that really got, like, slimy texture correct. Like, even a, a latex mask with, you know, uh, slime goo, some kind of cornstarch-based stuff poured over it just looks better than the best CGI. And we had got some pretty damn good CGI these days, but it just doesn't... There's just something about that real gooey sliminess that that captures you. And yeah, L let me just say here, like uh, uh, CG is wonderful and powerful and creates uh, incredible things. And and most really great movies these days have CG in them. Not one of the answers we got for this question is a, a CGI creation. Not yeah. a single one. And that does say something. I agree. Um, Coach Wargo says. Uh, the novel The Troop by Nick Cutter has some of the most disgusting body, body horror I've ever read. A Boy Scout troop is camping on an island when a gaunt, ravenously hungry stranger appears at the door of their cabin. Minor spoilers ahead. The troop leader, who is also a physician, lets the man in and tries to help. The troop leader sees things moving under the stranger's skin, performs a backwoods surgery complete with whiskey bottle as, sanit as both sanitizer and anesthetic, and black sludge and tapeworms begin 
uh, to emerge from the stranger's stomach. From there, uh, from there, we're, we're off to the races with the body as the infection spreads across the troop. As some get infected, worms emerge from their pores. There is oh. self-mutilation in an attempt to remove the worms, even self-immolation in an attempt to remove the worms, all described in graphic detail and made all the worse because no David Cronenberg special effect can ever match the CGI in one's head. Um, that reminds me of that book about the vine in the jungle. I forget the name of it right now. They made a movie out of it. But it was uh, all... Is that- it's, it's it's exactly what you're describing except it's a vine so yes i think i saw that movie i i read the book um, but never saw the movie because i was like is this the scary. one where they get trapped on the top of the temple yeah and then like the plants copy a cell phone noise to trick them into going down into yeah yeah man i, I didn't know that was based off a book it's not a great film but yeah the the like the plant the vines like growing out of their body is yeah great shit yeah uh tn bug doc says apart from the already mentioned the fly the movie that still gives me the creeps is hellraiser the villain frank summons a demon summon demons that drag him to a realm of internal torture but is resurrected by spilled blood while technically alive he remains horribly disfigured only tattered rags of meat and bones the middle of the film is a decomposition in reverse sequence as dear old uncle frank consumes the life force of a stream of sacrifice is lured to him by an ex-lover. This gradually restores his body, but never enough to make him whole, mind you. To get skin, a more direct method is employed with the final victim. Definitely a bit more gory than an alien tear assing around Manhattan in an Edgar suit. <laughs> Alas, his demons eventually catch up with him, rendering all his ill-gotten gains asunder and dragging him back to hell. The movie is a classic gore from the 80s and still disturbing to watch. The novella by Barker, The Hellbound Heart, differs in some small plot points, but it is well worth the read. I love Hellraiser. Have you ever seen Hellraiser? I have not. Um, it was. It just seemed a little beyond my my level personally. But mm-hmm. um, I, I, I I've been curious. I've been curious. It seems it seems like something grownups watch. You know. Well, uh, that's uh, you now. I I uh, that really wow. <laughs> um. I, I was thinking about the egg your suit and just realizing that someday I'm going to get a hire makeup artists and I'm going to be Edgar for Halloween. It's going to be great. That's a lot of work. It's going to cost $2 million. It's Can't wait till it. your kids are bored of trick or treating after 20 minutes. <laughs> and you just go sit at your house in your incredibly expensive egg your suit costume. And, and literally no one on the street recognizes it or appreciates it. Yeah. <laughs> great. Wonderful. Um, baby, can you dig your Sam says, uh, the fly is the definitive answer followed by the thing. So kudos to those responses. Um, a few more honorable mentions, uh, the brood, another batshit Cronenberg movie replete with body horror climaxing and a mother growing babies out of her torso. Mm-hmm. I'll also mention James Gunn's slither. My 15 year old son loved the humor in the movie, but could not stomach the body horror. He would just squeal and begged me to tell him when the gross stuff was over. I guess he won't be getting a job in the medical field. I don't, um, I don't, not only have I not seen either of these, but I don't even really know what they're about. Interesting. Uh, oh, you got to watch the brood. The brood's, I've never actually never seen Slither, so we should just watch that eventually. I love James Gunn, and I, for some reason, I just never watched Slither. All right. Cool. Uh, last, we have Jen Cat D, who says, hands down, no question. The answer is Rachel's sister, Zelda, in the original adaptation of Pet cemetery i still occasionally wake up in a cold sweat with her emaciated twisted body clad in its gauzy sickbed nightgown dancing at the corners of my psyche my sister will to this day crack open the window of her car and croak out rachel as i speed away in my house into my house in the dark of night after she dropped me off (laughs) oh man yeah i think didn't you mention that also bothering you um yeah scared the shit out of me absolutely 100 percent, terrifying yep 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 Good stuff. Don't like it. <laughs> uh, I think that's it, though. Yeah, that's yeah, that's all of them. That's Great it. answers, everyone. That was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. Yep. Um, and so that brings us to next week's discussion question, which is, who's your favorite sucky character that we desperately want to see have a turnaround? Yeah, in in honor of uh, of Johnny Marinville. Yeah. Now, at this point, we don't actually know whether Johnny does have his turnaround. So no. you can pick a character who does have a dramatic 
moment, um, like the Han Solo I mentioned earlier, or just somebody you really wanted to have a turnaround but didn't. I think I, I part of me wants to hear more of those answers. Not that I'm I want to bias you in any way because you can answer however you want, but I. I I, I do like that character archetype of just like the guy who you want to see turn it around and they just can't manage it. I can think of a few examples. Um, they're some of my favorite characters, really. So, yeah, yeah, I agree. I think either way would be a lot of fun. And uh, and we'll know we'll know by by reading those answers next week, whether that happens for our boy, Johnny. So uh, cool. It's gonna be fun. All right. It's gonna be fun. But that is it for us this week. As we said, next week we are finishing Stephen King's Desperation. And this is a reminder for all of you out there. The moment, the moment we finish Desperation, you need to pick up the regulators and start reading because we have a two-week break, uh, one of which we will be doing our overview episode for Desperation. The other, we'll be watching the TV movie Desperation. And then we are doing our single solitary episode on Stephen King's, Richard Bachman's, The Regulators. So as soon as you finish reading Desperation, begin reading the regulators that Matt was really actually just my way of reminding you that you're going to have to do that. I gotcha. Gotcha. So, so do it. Do, just do, do it. Do it. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, remember you can reach out to us at uh, Kingslingers pod at gmail.com or over on Twitter at Kingslingers pod. And of course the subreddit at reddit.com slash R slash doof media is the best place to answer the discussion question subscribe that's right just um, trying to simplify the outro a little bit here i, I like that um <laughs> and if and if you enjoy kingslingers and you want to support us then please head on over to patreon.com slash doof media and do the thing do the thing you'll be able to hear our castle talks episode which I, i'm not not to toot my own horn too much i guess our horn our collective horns our, yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a really good episode. I really, I thought we did a good job and I, I want y'all to listen to it. So please do. Yeah, me too. Of course, if you cannot afford to become a member of our Patreon community right now, that is absolutely okay. You can always help us out by just sharing the podcast with all your Stephen King loving friends or just randomly over social media. Also, you can help us by leaving a rating and a review. This week's review comes from Kate Z who, uh, Matt, <laughs> uh-huh. It gave us one star. Uh huh. And I'm gonna leave this. Leave, I'm gonna read this review, and you tell me if you think this is a one star review. Here okay. We go. Excellent. <laughs> Not a good start. <laughs> I was in the depths of the Song of Susanna when I began casually listening to this podcast while driving or taking care of housework. It's been lovely to refresh my memory of the early story while nearing the end of my journey. I love the format of Kingslingers, the high level nerddom and playful banter. As a high school English teacher, I must say these two gentlemen would give many of my colleagues a run for their money. Bravo. Thank you. Well, thank you, Katie. And just a, a gentle suggestion that you can change the number of stars <laughs> that you left. We do appreciate your kind words, though. Um, it doesn't really hurt us, to be honest, to have one one star review. But no, no, uh, we have to, this. This is this is our second one star. Our, review. Is our second one star review. So you know, the, yeah. the, uh, thank you for your for your review. Uh, I, I just I was like I read this and I was like this is so nice and then I looked at the stars <laughs> and I was like did something happen? Was this an old review that she changed to one star because we said something she didn't like? <laughs> oh, no. What happened? What happened? <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Maybe no, she meant we're like first, you know. That that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. When there's only one star, it's me. Yeah, the num- number one stars. <laughs> no, thank you so much, Katie. We're just messing with you. Change it if you want. You don't have to. It's just the only other one star review is from a person calling us pedophiles. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Anyway. <laughs> And thank you to everyone else who has taken the time to send those reviews in. Uh, they really do help. We really do appreciate them. It's great to read. And uh, and we, we're glad uh, that you folks largely enjoy the show. Yeah. But that's it. We'll be back next week as we wrap up Stephen King's Desperation. Oh, I can't wait, Matt. It's a, it's going to be a fun end for sure. One I'm way or so the other. excited. Yeah. We'll see you then. Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. 